Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Kieran, and welcome to the Complex Lower Extremity Trauma course. Um, it, this is an educational conference put on by the Harvard Global Orthopedics Collaborative um, in collaboration with our partners in uh, Gambia, Sierra Leone, Ghana, uh, and Burkina Faso. So we're really, really grateful to everybody for joining today and for all the wonderful cases that we'll discuss. So just as a way of introduction, um, so this is me, Kieran, and, and Keba has been my partner in crime from the Gambian side helping organize this course. Um, big thanks to Keba for all his hard work in getting this together. Um, and really big thanks to all of the HGOC organizing team. So we wouldn't be able to do this today if it wasn't for these four extraordinary gentlemen who put in all the hard work in recording the lectures, organizing the course agenda, um, editing the videos and putting the lectures on YouTube. Uh, sending out all the emails. So big, big thank you to everybody. Uh, so here's our agenda today. Um, this is the introduction happening right now. Uh, we'll dive right into session one, which will all be on complex polytrauma. Uh, then we'll go into session two on managing complications. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about proximal femur, uh, but a lot of the cases will be actually on uh, open tibia, um, you know, infections and non-unions, things like that. And then session three, we'll talk about post-traumatic reconstruction. We've got excellent cases uh, that go into both soft tissue and bony reconstruction. Looking forward to that. And then we'll just have a few moments at the end where we'll, uh, uh, we'll have some concluding remarks. Okay, so just uh, as a Zoom etiquette, you know, since we're all doing this for two years now, thanks to COVID, we all should know how to do this already. But just as a reminder, um, please, if you can, turn on your video. It's always lovely, especially on a weekend, to see smiling faces instead of blank screens. Um, keep your microphone on mute, if you will, so that we don't interrupt any of the presenters. The chat is open to all, so please do type in questions, raise your hands if you would like to, uh, to make a comment, and we'll try to include you in the conversation. So here are the course objectives. Today, we're going to be trying to improve participants' knowledge of complex lower extremity trauma management principles, foster an international discussion regarding orthopedic trauma care delivery, and then motivate and support the younger generation of orthopedic surgeons in Gambia, Sierra Leone, and West Africa in general, because I know we have several people on the call from uh, um, Burkina Faso and from Ghana. So this is the course structure that we had. I hope everybody's been following along as we've gone. Um, you know, last weekend, we launched the self-directed learning plan. This included wonderful lectures. Um, you know, we've got some of our lecturers here on the call today, including K-Rod, Dr. Banerjee, uh, Dr. McCoy, uh, thank you guys so much for your lectures. Um, sorry, I'm hearing a bit of an echo, my bad. Uh, anyway, so the, the, during the course of the week, the purpose of that self-directed learning plan was to go through and kind of uh, learn at your own pace, watch the lectures, read the articles, and then that should all have been in preparation for today, where we'll have this live session, um, where it'll all be case-based discussions. So uh, I do encourage everybody who has been involved, um, uh, who has received the learning plans to go ahead and please take a look at all those excellent resources. Um, and so these are just some of the, these are all the lectures that we had posted and they're all available for free on YouTube. All the articles are available free for download. Uh, so really exceptional faculty have provided some really awesome lectures. Uh, and we are hoping to translate all of these lectures into French as well. Um, Malik, I'm looking at you for your help with this at some point. Um, and, and so that will be wonderful. So these will all be available. So without further ado, let's begin our first session uh, on complex polytrauma. Uh, but actually, before I begin, Keba, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to say a few words if you wanted to, to just kick off this, uh, uh, this, this session. Thank you for the introduction. I think you've done most of it. Uh, just to say um, a big thank you to Kieran, especially for helping organize this, and Abdullahi, who helped initiate it. Uh, as well as all the lecturers who provided some very good content for the week. I think they'll be very useful to uh, faculty in the country and faculty participants in the countries um, that we're targeting, uh, especially since they're going to stay up so people can go back to refer to them. So thank you all for contributing to this, uh, uh, to what should be a good learning experience and hopefully some good uh, discussions today and good learning points today as well. Thanks, Kaba. Yeah, and I would just encourage that all the trainees, uh, the majority of people who registered for this conference are trainees. So this is really a conference directed towards you. So please do ask questions and participate in the discussion. There is no learning without participation. So, uh, all right, well, let's begin with session one on complex polytrauma. So these are the three cases that I have lined up. Malik, would you like to present? 
All right, Malik, can you see that? Yes. All right, go ahead. Okay, thank you, everybody. I'm glad to, to be part of this. I would like to share you my case from Bobo Julaso University Hospital. It's a case I received last year. It's very, very, it's making me very, uh, it's, it's, next slide, please. Next slide, please. I a male patient around 50 years. He was working he, he was uh, working as a nurse in the in the community hospital and I received him uh, on May 20, 2021 after a motorcycle accident and he sustained it next slide a traumatic brain injury a pelvic disruption left femur fracture a left knee burn a severe right knee sprain a right leg wound and a left forearm fracture dislocation. At this time, we have the CT available, and we 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 do a, 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 a we, and we and this help us to do the the CT. And for the pelvic disruption, we have a disruption on the pelvic side and the fracture around the the sacral. Uh, sacral part. Next slide. The femur fracture was, next slide. Yes, the femur fracture was diaphyseal, it was closed fracture. Next slide. On the left knee, he has a, 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 a large burn, it was, uh, his uh, motorcycle fell on him. So the, so he was burned by his motorcycle, a light, light, Next slide. And on the right knee, he had a severe sprain. The knee was unstable on all planes. Next slide. Also, he sustained in his right leg a, a wound, but no fracture. He had also, next slide, a forearm fracture. I will, I will focus on the Lower part, uh, extra, lower extremity uh, injuries. Next slide. We plan a two times surgery. First, uh, damage control with uh, X fix on the pelvic, on the on the knee for on the femur and for the the, the left knee. We, we we clean the wound and for the uh, for the right knee, we clean the wound, and for the left knee, we put a, a splint. Next slide. He stayed in intensive care for nine days. We we had a, a, a blood problem; it was not available at that time, so we had to wait to get to get him very to get him blood, and we controlled the white cells and the seroactive protein to make to to make us, uh, to allow the, the second surgery planning. And we are, we are sorry, my, I'm not a native English, so I'll try to, to, to find my word. The first question we faced was where we will do the surgery. In that time, the, the fluoroscopy was not available in our, in our public hospital. So we have to look a private hospital for that, for the implant. Uh, which kind of implant we will choose. Here we are not, uh, uh, there is not um, an insurance. So people have to buy themselves the implant. So we have to choose the lower cost implant and uh, the patient and his family have to be uh, prepared for the surgery. So next slide. So we perform uh, the, the second surgery on uh, after two weeks and we start with the pelvic, we remove the x fix we put the plate on the public symphysis, and we put the screws in the sacro, sacro uh, iliac joints. For the femur, we choose a retrograde femur nail because we, we will want, we don't want to, we choose not to, to change position, we, we choose a supine position and we choose this position to make all the surgery on one position, not to remove all the drapage and change the patient position. 
for the forearm we put a plate. Next slide. This was we we, we, we did it on um, fluoroscopic control. Ne next slide. This is for the place for the pubic, the screw for the sacroiliac joint and the sacral fracture. Next slide. And uh, next slide. And for the femur, we put a retrograde nail. Next slide. This was uh, this nail was available uh, for free. The, the, uh, so the patient did not have to pay for the nail. Next slide. And uh, on the forearm, we put a plate on the radius side and the uh, radio ulnar joint was fixed by a car wire. Next slide. Things goes bad after that. The patient lost uh, 20 kilos. He started rehab at day five, but uh, the, for the right knee, it was okay, the, the wound healed. But for the femur, he, he starts to, to complain of pain and, and uh, the nail fails. And we decide at after 20, 24 weeks to remove the nail and to put a, an X fix. The patient refused to, to have an X fix. And uh, next slide. And uh, after 40 weeks, he, he had an anterior fistula, large fistula with uh, two, two batteries found equally and two strati. But uh, we had uh, some uh, consolidation, some uh, union on the medial side, but the, the, the knee was stiff. Next slide. For the pelvic track, uh, on the pelvic side, the the sacrum healed, but the the sacrum heal, uh, the sacrum screw broke, and the symphysis opened. Next slide. The outcome was good on the forearm, but for the left knee, the instability was so, was. Uh, was present with uh, just 20 degrees of flexion and uh, an important amyotrophy of the quadriceps muscle. Next slide. So we we convinced the patient for a stage three surgery on on the on the right side to to do a release for his knee to remove the nail and to perform a debridement of the. Or infection. Next slide. He agreed, and finally, uh, we removed the nail. And the last time I see him, it was like last week. The the, the wound healed. Like next slide. Next. Uh, yes, and uh, we have a, a stable femur callus. This allow him to. To walk with sticks. This next slide. This case uh, learned us some things, some some uh, some point. The first was the patient we need. Uh, you see, we start on uh, on March 2021, and till now we are just uh, we just uh, the treatment was not okay. So. You have to make to be patient, and the, and the, the patient also has to understand everything. And we need also resource. It was uh, for the operating room for necessitation for biology, and an initial good management management is mandatory. And we need multiple stage uh, surgery, and a good rehabilitation program. Here we have a pro problem with, with the right, but with the upper limb fracture. It was impossible for us to to use sti uh, sticks on for the beginning, so it was a uh, very very difficult for the rehabilitation. And uh, motivation is also mandatory for the patient for his family because the family support the patient, 
and also for the children. Uh, if you have uh, failure in surgery, it's it's not very uh, easy to accept that. Okay. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you, Malik. Um, and I thought your English was perfect. I had no problem understanding you. Um, thank you very much for presenting a very tough case. Um, so K-Rod um, and uh, Dr. Banerjee, maybe I could ask you both to perhaps provide some comments on that. Um, I think there are a lot of important teaching points from that case that Malik just showed. And I think a lot of challenges that perhaps were related to the, the challenges in the health system uh, and the availability of the resources that were available early on. So Malik, I'd love to hear your comments on that as well. Um, but uh, but K-Rod, why don't you take it away first? Any any um, comments? Yeah, yeah well, I, I think Malik, there was an excellent presented case. It, it, you know, it, it's a kind of complex multi-trauma case that plagues all of us all, all over the world, you know? And, and I have to say your, your thought process and your rationale and your choice of procedures was exactly what it should have been. Um, you know, the, the, the points that I would, that I would uh, focus on, uh, j j just to offer you some, some thoughts and, and, and obviously with the benefit of retrospective uh, <laughs> vision of what happened, right? So, so the, the two week duration between your initial urgent care, your stage one, your stage two, um, did you, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious where that was mostly the result of system logistics uh, or, or truly uh, a, a result of waiting for physiology to catch up? That's one question. And the other, the other one, in, in terms of the technical perspective, you did everything very well. I think that you know, the retrograde nail could have been a little bit more longer, but you, know, you were limited by the, by the availability of the implant. I know that's the only length you had. It would, it, chances are it would have gone well most of the time. And I wonder whether in this case, uh, you know, the patient started failing and then became infected or the patient became infected and that's why he failed. And we may, we may never know, but those two processes are obviously tied. And for the, for the pelvis, you did everything right. I will tell you, when I have the, the males who are very heavy, I just add a second plate in the front because universally the 3.5 millimeter plate, it just doesn't hold up to, to fat big guys like me. You know, if, if I, particularly if, if you don't have the benefit of the crutches, you're going to have a patient that is going to have to get around and, and they're going to put more weight earlier than what you thought. So I usually put a second two hole plate orthogonal. So you have your plate just like you did and one at 90 degrees and that buys you a few more months of, 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 of resistance. And I think your sacroiliac really screw may have failed because the plate in the front loosened up and then it started putting, then, then everything was on the hands of the SI school. And a little trick. So when you have someone with, with, the, with, a, with an upper extremity injury in the context of multiple lower extremity injuries, there's this thing called a, uh, you can modify one of the crutches to become a platform crutch. And you don't have to buy a fancy one. You can actually take the old traditional wood, wood uh, uh, crutch and just cut off the part and put a plate with a little stick and put a little cushion so that the patient bears the weight on the elbow and just uses the grip and a little tie over the, over the crutch to not put axial, axial load on the forearm. And they can still use the crutches and protects your galeazia repair, which by the way was excellent. That's, 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 my, that's my thoughts. So, so, if, so maybe if you could, if you could comment on the, the two week time interval, what, what led to that two week time interval and, and, uh, and any thoughts on your part would be welcome. Thank you. Molly, go ahead. Uh, I, I have an internet issue. To, I don't hear what, well. So the, the, the key points that K-Rod brought up were the, the time interval between when you first did the damage control to when you did definitive fixation. What was the key reason for why that two week period was there? Was that because you didn't have blood available? The patient was still sick? What was the main reason for that? Okay. I have to, understand, I have to respond. 
Do you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Yeah, I mean, just we're curious a little bit yeah. about, you know, what, yeah. Very, it's, this is very uh, quicker case we, we and then stage two in our practice. Hmm. Usually it's a uh, step because uh, we, it was difficult for us to for three surgery on one patient. And we have to choose just one first surgery. If fixed, if uh, gone bad, we just decided to go to, to bone setters. So sometimes to, to plan a second surgery. Yeah, Malik, your internet signal, I think is a little challenging. So I will just repeat what I think you were saying is that because the time in the operating room can sometimes be so limited, the delays can add up. And so even two weeks was actually quite quick in your setting to get this patient back into the operating room. Yeah. It's, it's, it's correct. Um, well, thanks, Malik. Uh, Dr. Banerjee. Here in. Oh, yes. Sorry. Here yes, Dr. Smith. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Can I add something? Because I do a lot of polytrauma. Um, um, this is Malcolm Smith. Um, I'm another orthopedic trauma surgeon uh, uh, here in Massachusetts. So I would like to congratulate you. You did a fantastic job keeping the guy alive. And I think it's really important to, to step aside from the detail, which is always the critical thing, but, but and look particularly at the principles of looking after seriously ill injured patients. And the first thing to do is to just get in control of the trauma. And I, and I think you did that very well. You got the external fixator on, you controlled the bleeding, got an intensive care. It's just, it, and, and then you decide what to do based on the importance of injuries, based on what's threatening life first, what's threatening limb second, and then what's just disability limiting. All important, but important in different, different scales. And obviously the pelvic fracture and any bleeding and the overall trauma and wounds are the primary issue and you did really well with the principles. It's, we have the same problems with things failing in longer term, and we've got different resources. That's not a problem that, you, that it's your fault, it's just how things happen. And these patients have complex, multiple problems for a long time. And it's very typical that, that if you manage to get in control at the beginning, that you're then left with other problems as well. So I would like to say you did very, very well, but the most important thing, no matter where you are in the world, is to follow the same principles. I think you did that very well. Thank you. Yeah, great point, Dr. Smith. Dr. Banerjee, did you have any comments yeah. to make? Yeah, so I have a large number of comments to make on this because we have been in very similar circumstances when we started doing polytrauma in under-resourced areas. So this was, I would say, about 1997 onwards for the first few years, then resources picked up. So the issue is here that... Um, First, what you did was absolutely perfect. You put an X-fix on the pelvis, you put an X-fix on the femur, you put orthosis. That bit was absolutely textbook and very good, and you saved the life of the patient. But then, when you're coming on to stage two, I would have done things a little differently. Now, these pelvic injuries, our experience, because we've dealt with a lot of them, is that they, they are injuries that could kill you in the first two or three days. But once you have gotten over the initial trauma, the, the morbidity, if you, even if you don't fix them, you can get away often by treating many of these injuries conservatively with various types of traction. So my focus would have been entirely on the femur fracture not on the pelvic fracture. And what I would have done is that I would have kept the X fix on in the pelvis and I have, would have done an anti-grade femoral nail to start with. Because the femur is very important. It's, it's very important from various points of view and you need, really need to fix the femur to get the guy moving. So this is the first issue. Now, second issue about the two-week gap which has been referred to, I mean, if you had an OT problem, time problem, I mean, I, I cannot give an answer to all that. But what I would have done again, in, I would not have delayed by 15 days. 
if you had your two X fixes in position, then I would have done, you know, sorted out the simpler injuries in the interim. So if your patient was stable, I would have perhaps, uh, you know, fixed the galliazy at that stage so that you had a functional arm earlier in the game. I would have dealt with the knee issues, the lateral ligam, which is torn. I would have tried to have sorted that out. So I would have used the interim period and then come 15 days, I wouldn't have done everything in one go. So I would first have fixed the femur anti-grade. That would have been my focus. And then subsequently take another little bit more time. You can do something for the pelvis if you wish to. But again, I want to tell you, and please remember this, that a large number of these patients, you might be left with a little bit of deformity, but you can get away doing minimal surgery. So concentrate on femur, get your other injuries out of the way and go for early mobilization, take off the X-fix. And uh, I'm not sure, a retrograde nail in this case, I think was not a good idea. And the retrograde nail, which was done, unfortunately is a little bit short. So you need a, if you if you have to put a retrograde nail, you really need to go well through the isthmus. Otherwise, you're not going to get uh, a union because th th there was not enough, uh, you know, proximal bit of nail to get stability. So uh, I think the very important focus in dealing with polytrauma is that you really need to sit down and plan your second stage. And I think if you have heard my talk, what we do in India or what our team used to do or still do is that we split it up into several episodes. So you try to do a bit and then you try to stabilize and you finish off all your surgery bit by bit so that the, at the end of it, um, you have a good result. But just to summarize with one point, in this case, the fem in stage two, the femoral fracture was more important than the pelvic fracture. We have one question from the audience. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Kamal is asking, how much time delay between the X-fix removal and definitive fixation? Um, I guess we could ask, uh, you know, any of the pelvic surgeons that we have on the line, uh, K-Rod, uh, Dr. Smith, Dr. Banerjee, what is your typical uh, period of time that you wait? I mean, I think it has a lot to do with the patient stability, obviously. But um, two weeks is good. I mean, that two weeks interval was, I think that was appropriate. K Rod, what are your thoughts? No, I, I, I think, you know, it's exactly what you said is whenever the patient is ready uh, and, and, and you're not going to, your, your surgery is not going to become an additional burden to the patient, but it's going to make it better. You don't want the patient to get worse, you want the patient to get better. But, but I, I do, I do, you know, it, it, once you are three, four, four weeks out, you know, this particular case wasn't uh, horribly um, uh, deformed. Uh, yeah, the reduction becomes a lot more difficult, right? Particularly if you're dealing with with bone, with, with fracture planes. So it may, maybe if not a pelvic ring injury, but if you have a complex as a tabular fracture or something like that, there is obviously some advantage to fixing it a bit earlier if, if, if it's safe for the patient. So, so it's hard to give you an answer. I, I think if you were to look at our, our experience on average, uh, you know, we, we, we usually proceed from, from uh, a stage one care, you know, damage control care to definitive care with, with, within a week or so. Thanks, Kiran. Um, Dr. Yeboa, from your perspective, I don't know if you're still on the line, uh, from your perspective from, from Kumasi in Ghana, uh, what are your thoughts seeing a case like this? Um, you know, given the resources that you guys have available in your experience dealing with polytrauma? Yeah, thank you, Karan. Um, we would have done it uh, pretty similar to the way uh, Malik did it. And um, my only concern was the kneeling of the femur. Um, I think anti-grade kneeling will have improved the biomechanics. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Yeboa. Yeah, I mean, I think, Malik, you were in a challenging situation. Perhaps the patient was unstable and you didn't want to reposition the patient. And perhaps also you didn't have a long enough nail because you only had the ones that were available. You mentioned the challenges that you have with implant availability. Uh, and, um, uh, and that nail you said was free. Was it a sign nail that you used? Not a sign nail. But uh, it was free. It was available in the hospital for you. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I mean, these are these are the, sometimes the big challenges that we have. I mean, I think that Dr. Smith made the point perfectly that Malik applied the principles perfectly, you know, going step by step, saving the patient's life first, then the limb. I think Dr. Banerjee's point about prioritizing perhaps the femur rather than the pelvis, I think is an interesting one, you know, with limited resources, is that a learning point from this case? Um, I mean, I would say that, you know, in my experience, and I've learned everything that I've learned from Dr. Smith and Dr. K-Rod, um, you know, fixing the femur and allowing uh, the X-fix to come off certainly helps the morbidity of the patient for mobilization um, rather than having a big, uh, big X-fix on. Um, but uh, Dr. Smith, K-Rod, what, what do you, what do you think about that? Would you, would you have maybe opted for leaving the X-fix on? So you asked about staging and timing. Hmm. So in my environment where I've got a lot of intensive care and got resources to do things when I want to, then if a patient is so sick, they have to have damage control, which means that, that physiologically they just aren't capable of withstanding a big early surgery, then normally it's four or five days before I go back. And that's how long it takes for the normal physiological response to major trauma to settle out. Then I go back as soon as I can to get in control of things. Um, as far as the X-Fix goes, you've got a window to change it of probably about two weeks max. Um, after that, the risk of infection because the pin size goes up significantly, and I wouldn't change it. Um, if you've got position, you're holding position, depends on your environment and the place that you're in, it might be better to leave it like it is. Um, again, it's down to principles, isn't it? It's understanding what, what you're trying to do, understand the environment you're in, what you've got available, and doing the best that you can. Wonderful. Well, thanks. Uh, K-Rod, I saw that you unmuted yourself. Do you have another comment that you want to make? No, I, I agree with Malcolm. I, I think I think uh, Malcolm points out in the timing from conversion from X-Fix to definitive fixation, that's certainly true for long bones. Uh, you know, I, 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 I may be a bit more permissive with the, with the pelvis if it helps, because the, the pelvic pain is a little bit further away from the area where you're going to work with, but, but, the, but the, time, the time bracket is right on. Well, thanks. Malik, that was a fantastic case. Thank you for starting off our conference so strongly. That was great. And thank you all for the comments. Uh, Keba, uh, should we move to your case, perhaps? Yeah, sure. I can go with mine. Yeah. Or did you have any comments for, for Malik on his case before we dive into yours? Up to you. Uh, then we can do mine and then take some more. I yeah. Think I, have, I share similar circumstances with Malik. and I fully understand the way the case went, to be honest. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so very familiar um, in many different countries. Um, so, Keba, do you want to share your slides yourself, or should I share yours? Uh, I can do it. I should okay. Be able to. Go ahead. Can you see it okay? Yes, perfect. Okay, so uh, mine is uh, another polytrauma case uh, where the patient had a lateral hip fracture dislocation, an open patella fracture, and a closed tibia fracture with a soft tissue wound to his heel. So he's a 52-year-old male who was a motorcyclist and uh, was hit by a vehicle uh, coming off the motorcycle. And uh, this happened in April of 2020. So really, this case for me has a lot of learning points, but also it's a bit of a lesson on how to deal with difficult patients. And as Malik said, um, needing patience to deal with some patients. Um, so this gentleman had an isolated, had isolated ipsilateral lower limb injuries with a posterior hip dislocation with an associated posterior wall as, as a tabular fracture. And as you can see in the picture, he had a, an open patella fracture with uh, some mild damage to the cartilage on the medial femoral condyle, uh, lateral femoral condyle actually. And, um, with some loss of the inferior pole of the patella, and I'll show the x-rays shortly. He had a closed tibia fracture on the same side with some abrasions on the front of the shin, um, and it was a comminuted fracture, and this sort of horseshoe laceration to his heel, but with no underlying bony uh, component. So that's his, these are his x-rays uh, showing the hip fracture dislocation. The patella fracture with uh, loss of at least half of his patella and half of the articular surface. Though clinically, there was no evidence of a knee dislocation. Um, and uh, he had this closed tibia fracture 
which was commuted but closed. So he, on the night of arrival, actually, he was, there was an attempt to reduce the hip uh, and it didn't go back. So the plan on the next day, so he came at a, a night and the next day, the surgeon that, whose care he was under took him to theater to sort of wash out and close his wounds, uh, an attempted reduction of his hip and then put in a distal femoral pin for skeletal traction and placed an external fixator on his tibia. And these are what his wounds look like after, after a few days. And this is the knee wound, which was just closed. There was no excision of any bony fragments. The heel was doing fine. And you can see the abrasions on the tibia with the external fixator in place. So X-ray is showing the uh, femoral traction pin. And as you can see, this is what's left, what remains of his patella after the debris mark and um, at the washout and the external fixator. And again, sometimes we do have challenges with our x-rays in terms of the views that we're given. I'm still working on that. And you can see a reasonably looking AP, but we don't see a proper lateral of the distal femur, a distal tibia rather. He had a CT scan in the days where we had working CT, uh, which showed that even with the traction on, um, or after reduction, this was the position of his hip. We did suspect that the traction was removed to have the CT, have the CT scan done, but still there's some and a posterior wall fracture. So this was done on day four. He was then handed over to me. Um, so we, uh, on the 28th of May, so almost a month after being in hospital, and the plan was then made to do an open reduction of his hip uh, and to fix the posterior wall fragment, which on the CT scan appeared significant, uh, significant size. And given what his patella looked like, to a patellectomy. So there was a significant delay. Um, I actually wasn't at work, I uh, was bereaved during those days. So that's why possibly a long delay between the index uh, surgery and the pelvic surgery. So he had the pelvis fixed. Um, interoperatively, there was uh, some uh, sort of margin impaction to the femoral head, but he wasn't really hinging after fixing uh, the wall fracture. It seemed fairly stable. So that the decision was to just leave things at that and see how he would get on, uh, excise the, the remaining fragment of the patella, as I say. On subsequent ward rounds, uh, he was always seen lying with the hip slightly internally rotated and with some shortening of the leg, but then the tibia was fixed and slightly shortened, as you can see from the fibula. Uh, so just not being comfortable with that, we took him back to the uh, theater to check under the image intensifier and see whether or not the hip was indeed in joint. And the uh, Images, as you can see, confirmed that it wasn't joint and it was stable. So he was eventually discharged home, uh, partially ambulating, partially weight bearing with a frame on day 45, uh, and with a plan to continue with physiotherapy, especially for his knee, which was starting to become stiff as he was reluctant to move it. Uh, he then decided to have some additional local physiotherapy with the bone setters and then there seemed to have been a lapse possibly on our part where he came back to clinic on the 5th of uh, July and had an x-ray then but went home from the clinic or either didn't come back after being sent to do the x-ray. He then returned, sorry for the typos, just um, another month later, so now we're in August after the initial injury was in April, uh, with the x-ray from July, complaining of pain in the right hip and being unable to wait there. And when we reviewed the x-ray he'd had a month ago, a month prior, this was uh, what we were confronted with. So he had dislocated again, um, and that was obviously a source of his issues. You can I say that he was a bit of a difficult patient in terms of convincing him for surgery. So we had discussed, uh, at this stage, 
to do an open reduction or at least a trial of a closed reduction of the hip, but we didn't know how long it had been out. It was at least a month, maybe more than that. Uh, and he now had a stiff knee as well because he wasn't moving it and the external fixator was in place, um, but no signs of healing on that. I had offered him to have the external fixator changed to a nail and he didn't want to have surgery. And even with the hip, he decided to go back to the traditional healers to see if they could help to improve it. So say so the tibia is a non-union, non uh, three months at least, and with some shortening. And he declined um, intervention at that stage. So after trying for a few more months and not getting, not making any headway on his own, he came back uh, in November of that year. And at that stage, we had sort of had a discussion to say, you know, it's, it, the hip has been out at least since June, maybe. Uh, there was some damage in the initial surgery to the head. And I did prepare him to say, you know, maybe if we open it and we think that it's not salvageable, then we should think about doing a hip replacement at that stage. And he agreed to that. This was discussed on the first visit, actually, but he came back after three months to say, yes, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, complicating it as well, he also said he didn't want the nail, but he wanted the X-fix removed at that stage. And of course, his knee remained stiff still. So he had the hip replacement, uh, which was uneventful. Again, the hip was stable. And he was discharged home after a few days um, with uh, this in place. So that was in November. And then again, he disappears for a couple of months and comes back about eight weeks post hip replacement, complaining of pain in his right hip again uh, with instability when trying to walk on it of about seven weeks duration. So he says that everything started going wrong about a week after he left hospital, but he just didn't come back until eight weeks later. And x-rays done show the uh, hip replacement was also was dislocated. At that stage, I think he was, he himself was getting a little bit fed up. So he agreed to having the uh, what was now an established non union of his tibia. Uh, we had to move the back slab as well and noticed that it was still unstable and he couldn't walk on it. So he agreed to have a nail done for that and to have uh, an attempt to reduce the hip. The first uh, attempt uh, of a closed reduction failed, unsurprisingly, because again, I think it was at least re approaching two months. We did an MUA of his knee as well to try and improve the knee movement as that may be contributing to the dislocations and did a sign nail of his right tibia, uh, closed nailing. Technically, there were no signs of infection and all his wounds had healed satisfactorily. <clears throat> we then uh, spoke some more and consented for an open reduction of the hip. And then when he agreed to that, that was done five days later. Uh, of note, he still has this leg length discrepancy from his tibia and we prescribed a shoe raise. So trying to eliminate all the things that may cause the dislocation. So getting him level, getting the knee moving a bit more and reducing the hip, which when reduced was stable. This, uh, these are the x-rays of his nail, so AP and lateral. And then this was in January of 2021. And that was the last time I saw him until he came back again in January of 2022, reporting no problems with the hip, uh, mentioning that he'd been, he had been fully weight bearing with crutches. Uh, there was some movement in the knee, probably about a 20 to 30 degree arc of movement, but not significant. Uh, but now he was complaining of pain in his distal leg. Uh, these are the clinical pictures of the leg. So there's some mild swelling, but there was no wounds. Uh, it was slightly warm but there was no fluctuance or any sinus. And the doctor that saw him sent him home with analgesics and oral antibiotics. The x-ray also showed some healing on the lateral aspect. <coughs> so he then returned again a further two months later, now almost two years post the initial injury. 
with worsening of the swelling of the distal leg. Uh, now has a sinus uh, on the medial aspect with some prudent discharge, but his hip and knee at least so far were asymptomatic. The most recent x-rays uh, from last month show uh, so increased uh, healing at the fracture site of the tibia, um, but at the medial aspect where there's still a, a defect, uh, that's where he has the sinus and the purulent discharge. So it's a two-year journey with uh, this gentleman who has been challenging in many aspects, and now I have to decide where to go next with him and I'll open it up for discussion. Have a very challenging case. Thank you for sharing it. Uh, just a couple of points I wanted to clarify. Um, the, the time from initial X fix of the distal tibia up until the point where you nailed it, he was in the X fix that entire time or he was converted to a back slab or something like that? No, so he, uh, when he came with the dislocation of the native hip, uh, he asked for the X fix to be removed. Okay. Uh, so then he was in a back slab and then he removed the back slab himself. So when he had come back, there was nothing on the leg. Okay. And the pin tracts and everything from the um, X fix had healed up. No problem. It, all healed. it was many months after the X fix was removed in June, I believe, uh, or a bit later. And the knee, um, I mean, was there any extensor mechanism left in that knee after that injury? It was to just remove the bony fragment and then oppose the what was left of the sensor mechanism. He has intact extensor function and straight leg raise, yeah. um, but uh, I think the long period of immobilization caused him to have a very stiff knee. Yeah, yeah. All right. Wow, challenging. Very challenging case. Um, uh, Dr. Yaboa, do you have any comments after hearing that case? Yeah, um, I must. First, uh, congratulate um, Keba for a good work done. Gambia and Ghana have similar circumstances uh, when it comes to managing such challenging cases. But I would like um, Keba to clarify a few points for me. Um, may I know why he had to do patellectomy? Could the patella have been saved? And the second point is that um, uh, could he have treated the fibular fracture? Because it appeared quite distal um, and maybe may, may have improved ankle stability. Um, these are the two things I want him to clarify before I make my last comment. Keba? Yes, so for the patellectomy, uh, um, my reasoning, and I'm um, happy to hear what others think, he had lost, he had already lost half of the patella and he had this sort of sharp edge which was just grating on the femur that was left and there was nothing to salvage so i i, I that's why i went for the patellectomy i thought that it would do more damage just leaving that with that uh, sort of half of the patella in there than taking it out mm -hmm. uh with regards to the fibula again you know he had once he had the external fixator i don't know maybe you experienced this as well Sometimes getting people to have a second surgery can be very challenging. And I don't, I recall this gentleman didn't really want anything to be done to his tibia or to his lower limb. Thank you. My last point, uh, looking at the pelvic x-ray AP view that shows the dislocation after the plate fixation of the stabulum, you could see some, some loose fragments at the posterior wall. Probably if a plate had been placed there, to, to catch those fragments, probably it could have um, averted the, the dislocation that happened. I don't know, but this, these are my thoughts. Yes, I think going through his x-rays and his CT, he had a fragment that was anterior and seemed like it was attached to the capsule. And we never addressed that. And that follows through even to when he had hip replacement. That fragment that you see remains. I think that was anterior rather than posterior. Um, and you think that that's why he was unstable even with the hip replacement? Um, I mean, he's been stable since, uh, but I'm not sure. It may, it may have contributed to it a bit. Hmm. What role do you think the traditional bone setters had in all of this? Uh, I mean, it'd be very easy to blame them yeah. and rather, than, rather than say that it was uh, on our part. But I think compliance was an issue with him. 
uh, he was very keen, whatever we did, to supplement it with bone setter intervention. And various massages and pulling may have uh, dislocated either of the, the, natural, the naked hip or the hip replacement. But I mean, I say he's been stable for a year plus now and hasn't dislocated since. So hopefully, from the hip point of view, we're out of the woods. Yeah. Um, Malik, did you have any comments, um, you know, given that you just presented a polytrauma case? Thank you, Kiran. To uh, Keba for this one. Uh, one question and for, for the this. In my opinion, did it in um, I wouldn't I should I Malik, we're, the, Malik, I'm sorry to interrupt. We're having a bit of a hard time hearing you. The connection I think is challenging. Okay, do you hear it's coming in and out. In and out. It's better now. Uh, go ahead. You can speak and let's see. Okay, thank you. So I just said uh, I one comment. So for the comment, I would not put a prostate, in my opinion, for being sure that the leg is is and uh, with a wound here because in a patient uh, to to bone set it, the hip prosthesis is because they will flex good your prosthesis this is got affected you will find very, very, will be difficult for you. In my opinion, I have to wait for the hip, just and the, and the knee. Okay. Before putting up, in my opinion. So Malik, you were cutting in and out a little bit, but I'll try to summarize what you just said. Um, you worry about putting a prosthetic hip into a patient who's visiting bone setters because you worry about the motions that they'll put the patient through and the high risk of dislocation and infection. Yeah, it's an important teaching point, um, uh, especially if you work in a place with lots of traditional bone setters. So thanks for that. Um, okay. Uh, uh, Dr. McCoy, uh, Amanda, um, I know that you've, uh, you know, you've spent so much time working in East Africa and Kenya, different circumstances uh, to be sure, but perhaps some similar themes here. Just wondering if you could maybe share a few of your thoughts after listening to the case that Keba just presented. Oh, yes. Um, well, this is a very, very challenging case. It's always hard when you have multi-level trauma and open wounds. Um, and so you did a very good job. Um, I'm not quite a hip specialist. I am actually a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, but I took care of a lot of tibia fractures. And so when I so that to be a fracture, um, I did like the initial external fixation, external fixation, but sometimes you can add an additional plan fixation if you use kind of cross pins at the distal tibia, and that provides a little bit more rotational stability of the fracture instead of having it uniplanar. Um, but I think it looks good. Another thing to consider is that oftentimes you have these patients, you have them in traction. Sometimes you can actually have traction off of the external fixator that you put distally um, in order to leave. <clears throat> the femur a little bit more free. And that's just something that we did a lot if we had concomitant um, hip dislocations and tibia fractures. And in terms of managing the tibia fracture, um, oftentimes we would consider taking off our, taking off our X-fix and applying a PTB cast and allowing the patient to start putting some weight on the, well, it's, it was very hard because of the hip dislocation, but we often tried a PTB cast because that sometimes allowed for some stability as well. And if we had concerns about our X-fix pins, we would went to the cast so we could evaluate them. Um, in terms of where you are right now with the tibia fracture, so it looks like you have three or four cortices, three out of four cortices that are healed. And so at this point in time, I would consider taking out the nail. I would probably, I don't see a sinus tract, but you can see a sinus tract developing on that lateral, I think it was the lateral side. So I would probably consider doing a corticotomy there, an official corticotomy, and then reaming. 
and see, and then come back maybe a week or two later and then place an antibiotic nail. And at some, and after that, you can take out the antibiotic nail. Um, you know, these infected tibia, uh, partial unions, non-unions are really difficult to manage in a under-resourced setting because um, you have patient compliance issues. Um, sometimes it's, do you know what, you know what organism you're treating? Um, it's kind of difficult. I have a question for you. What happened to the heel wound? Have <laughs> the, the shoe race? Uh, I think he stopped wearing it because you can see the last picture. He doesn't have it anymore. Oh, he doesn't um, have it. Good. Yeah. He gave up with it. I think he's happy to just. Him. So he has a bit of an Aquinas deformity as well now because of the way he's been trying to walk. But yeah. Hmm. And you mentioned his leg length was a little off and all of that as well. Perhaps that contributed to it. And yeah, really. In some cases, it's actually not too bad to have a little bit of a leg length discrepancy because if you have a stiff knee and a stiff ankle, you need to clear for ambulation. That's a good point. Maybe that's what he figured out and that's why he ditched the shoe race. <laughs> Maybe. Um, all right, well, that was fantastic. Um, so we're running a little low on time. So I do wanna give Fatumata the chance to present her case of an open, open fracture because I think that that will have some important uh, just teaching points for all the junior folks. Uh, so uh, Fatumata, are you ready to go? I, I can pull up your case, I think. Do you want me to present yeah. it from my slides? Yes, please. All right. One moment. There we go. Is this the, is this the case that you wanted? I'm yet to see your screen. Yes, please. So you All can right. go to the next slide. I am sure. Fatumata from Gambia. So I'm a resident. So, so um, we had this case, EM. Um, he's a 38 year old male. Then he presented to the a &E. um, His mode of injury was pedestrian versus vehicle. He was the pedestrian. And then he presented about two hours into his injury to our a &E. So he had no um, free hospital care. So when he came in, his uh, wound was painted with a cotton and it was tied. So when we saw him, we did the normal procedure, the ATLS protocol, and then um, we noticed that he had an isolated um, injury. Um, so we then uh, took a clinical photo for him and then requested for some extras after doing the preliminary thing. Next slide, please. So those are the wounds that he had. Um, so he had um, it on his medial aspect of his ankle. So what we did at the A&E, we did irrigation of the wound with the normal saline, and then we did an accurate reduction and then splinted it. So we did a back and side slab for him, and then we bottled him on antibiotics, keftrazone to be specific. Next slide, please. So those were his x-rays in the um, POP. We didn't get the other x-rays. Uh, before the POP. Next slide, please. So um, with this patient, we had a second look in the theater that was 18 hours. Yeah. That was the next day. So he had a debridement and then uh, it was grossly contaminated. So then we made an assessment of an open fracture dislocation of the, of an, of the ankle because we could see. And then it was copiously washed in theater. And then, so we decided to just put him on x fix and then um, tag the wound, close the wound, yeah. So that, that was it in theater. So we had it really irrigated, remove all the contaminants that we could see. And then we applied x fix at this stage. So next slide, please. So that, that was the image of the x fix So we had to do um, an ankle bridging x fix for him. Um, it was very hard to um, not be at the site of the injury because it was going to be really far. Stability was, question, was going to be questioned. Next slide, please. So that was the X fix. Um, next slide. Yeah, that was it. So we had the ankle bridging and then we had stability and then we decided to close the wound in super simple switches. Next slide. So post-operatively, we did, um, it showed that we had a good reduction. At least uh, um, there was no um, dislocation showed. And then, so we were happy. So we decided to continue him on dressing, limb elevation in the ward, and then antibiotics 
uh, and also pain management for him. So he was a good patient. So we just started with knee exercise immediately and then he was, he was good. Next slide, please. So three weeks post injury, then we decided to convert it to Arif. Um, we wanted to do it um, within two weeks, but we didn't have the theater space. So it had to go up to three weeks. He didn't have any infection. That was why we decided to convert it to um, RF. So we did the um, same stage. We removed the X fix, um, that same setting. And then we decided to put in an RF into another incision, just a lateral plate uh, using a touch regular plate. And then we do two positional screws in osmosis screws, but we didn't repair the ligament on the medial side. Next slide. So that was the wound. We avoided the initial injury, uh, the wound from the initial injury. So that was what we did with the DCP. Yeah, sorry, one touch you will have sorry. Next slide, please. So the, you can see the pin side, uh, that was that of the x fix. So we did next slide. So that, that was the x-ray post, um, Arif X-ray, um, not very, not a very good quality, but this is what happened. So the joint was adequately reduced. Next slide. So postoperatively, we had to put him on non-weight bearing for six weeks, and then um, and he started weight bearing as tolerated after that, and then he did continue with his physio and then follow up. Next slide. So 10 weeks post injury, he was fully weight bearing without crutches and then his wound had already healed. So he didn't have any sign of infection. Next. So that's his um, recent x-ray um, and then his clinical picture. Now he's fully weight bearing uh, still with, without crutches. And then um, just that he's complaining of a bit of pain on the media um, side. Um, when he would, uh, would be for a long period of time. So that's for him, that's what we had. So inviting comments, no questions on the case. So this is just a summary of our technique um, that we did. It's the same as what I've just said, but it's just a summary. So we did a um, two-stage procedure. One was x fix the other one was RF. Then we, but what we made sure was to give antibiotics to this patient and then kept the patient in the hospital because we were scared that if this patient had gone home, he would have had an infection before coming back. So it was a, we didn't have much space for the patient, but this patient was just special. So we had to keep not to get infection. Next slide, please. So it's the same um, thing. So we had left the synthesis screws inside. Unless if he's symptomatic, then we will remove it. But that's our plan. He's still with it. Next slide. So the challenges that we had in this case were x -fix. So we had to scout for the external fixators. It wasn't much. So we had that issue when, before, when doing the surgery. So we had to do that. And then we were scared of, of of infection because it was grossly contaminated. And then, uh, but then we started the antibiotics early and then um, really washed out for him. So we were lucky. So the patient was um, compliant actually after the discharge, but sometimes it's actually a problem um, with patients. So we didn't have adequate imaging. So you could see that uh, we just had um, this one image post-op and then um, another image um, just after five months after um, the injury. Next slide, please. So solutions to this um, public um, awareness about the RTAs, maybe he wouldn't have because he was on his right side. And then, so we need more of external fixators to be able to do these cases because without them, it will be very difficult to control infection. And then infection control is a key thing for everyone to be able to do so that you can have good results. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, excellent case. Um, I think you've really summarized the key points to open fracture management here really nicely. Um, I'd like to invite a couple of the faculty members to maybe comment on this. Uh, K-Rod, did you have any thoughts? Yes. So, 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 
Everybody they antagonize the doctors, not the health sector. Go ahead, Kira. So, 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 Dr. Chaite mentioned at one point that she got lucky. She didn't get lucky. She had an excellent outcome because she demonstrated judgment, technical expertise, and appropriate uh, stage treatment, second look, and antibiotic uh, care. So I couldn't think of, of a, you know, there's nothing really to comment. This is an outstanding management. That's the I word. What I say you tell? What I mean you tell? I think uh, the result has been miraculous uh, if you look at the initial injury because uh, that was a case where I think a lot of people would have considered doing a primary amputation straight away. I'm not trying to say this next. So it is a fantastic outcome. I would like to congratulate you. Uh, my only comment right now would be that I would remove the syndesmosis screws and put in smaller screws into the fibula because those screws are liable to break once you put weight on it. So, so that because if it breaks, then you won't be able to remove the broken screw from inside the tibia. So it's best to take them out by a take care procedure, the stab wounds, take out the screw and put in shorter screws for the fibula. Thank you. My consultant is here, so he's hearing you. Thank you. Thank you. Is that you, Keba? It's no, it's uh, Dr. Ka. Ka. Ah, Dr. So, Ka. Ka. Ka is actually one of our trainees uh, <laughs> who has recently moved across to Malawi to do her residency there. So this was a case that she did before she left. Uh, okay. Uh, is Dr. Ka on the line? Does he want to make a comment? Yes. Yes, he's there. He's online. Hello, everyone. Hello, Dr. Ka. Thank you for joining. Oh, thank you very much for the opportunity. I must congratulate uh, Dr. Jeta for a job well done. Uh, she was very passionate about this patient. One of the reasons why we have to keep him in the hospital, they wouldn't discharge and risk um, him getting infected back home. So like you all said, um, from the in, uh, onset, we adhere to the principles of managing open practice. Um, the patient was well debrided, um, irrigated properly, started on antibiotics, and uh, we got lucky because he was a compliant patient, and he was a very patient guy as well, despite the fact that he stayed a little long in the hospital, but he was patient because he wanted his leg to get back to work. So thank you very much, and congratulations, Dr. Jaden. Thank you. I just have to say this is a job very well done. Um, oftentimes when these patients come, we actually start talking to them about the process of amputation early on and say, we'll do some washes, but oftentimes it goes very, very south. So this looks great. Very nicely done. What a lovely way to end our first uh, morning session on, uh, on complex polytrauma and open fractures. Um, so we are running a little bit behind schedule, but why don't we just give everybody a five minute break to use the bathroom or whatever you guys need to do. And then we'll move on to session number two on managing complications, infections, malunions, and nonunions. Is that all right? All right, five minutes. We'll see you back in just a moment. All right. Well, I think that's fine. So um, welcome back, everybody. Um, I think that first session was really fantastic. Amazing cases. Really great discussion. Uh, so now we'll move into session number two on managing complications. Uh, we'll be looking at infections, malunions, and nonunions, primarily of the lower extremity, obviously. Most of the cases that we have are uh, of the tibia, uh, but we do have a good case on uh, proximal femur uh, nonunion if we do have time from, uh, from K-Rod. Uh, so these are the, the cases. Um, I'd like to start uh, with Dr. Yeboah's case uh, from Ghana. So Dr. Yeboah, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. So I'm Dominic Yeboah from Ghana. Um, from the Confanoti Teaching Hospital. I'd like to present this case we have been managing. Um, this was a 14-year-old female with no history of chronic disease. Uh, you saw this patient in our clinic with complaints of recurrent discharging sinuses on the anteromedial right leg with inability to bear weight on the right leg for the previous one and a half years. Um, she sustained the injury um, to the right tibia and fibula after a fall into a gutter from a standing height. He, she presented to a hospital where plate fixation 
of the tibia was done with a 4.5 millimeter DCP. The fracture failed to unite and the plate was exchanged for an intramedullary nail. The sinuses developed after three months, uh, three months after the intramedullary nailing, but the fracture failed to heal and she was referred to our center. At our initial assessment, we saw a well-nourished teenager. There were five sinuses on the anteromedial right leg, as you can see. Uh, three had healed and two were actively discharging purulent offensive fluid. There was abnormal movement at the mid portion of the right leg. There was five CM shortening of the right uh, tibia with five degrees of persequinus. The ankle was stiff with a range of motion of five to 15 degrees. And the stellatural knee had a normal uh, mobility. X-ray of the right tibia and fibula was taken. And as you can see, the, um, the nail in the tibia was a little prominent in the knee. We had, uh, we saw multiple circular wires along the shaft of the tibia. The fracture line was persistent at the middle third of the shaft of the tibia at the same level as a fibula also in a union. Um, one and a half years down the line, there was no radiographic evidence of healing and the fracture ends were rounded and uh, sclerotic and tapered. So our plan for this patient was to extract the nail, perform a thorough debridement, um, irrigation, antibiotic PMMA cement placer, uh, spacer, and mount an external skeletal fixation. Um, the extraction of the PMMA antibiotic cement spacer was intended to be done six weeks after the initial surgery, and then we will fill the void with cortical cancellous autograft. Um, and then uh, we remove the external fixator when the graft was incorporated. So this was our plan uh, before we began the treatment. The first surgery was performed. And as you can see, the nail was extracted from the tibia. We remove all infected necrotic tissues. Necrotic bone was removed. Bone was excised until we got to fresh bleeding bone. And uh, the circular wires were removed from the tibia. And through an incision at the anterior knee, we did extensive industrial remain to remove all infected necrotic tissue from the endosteum. And uh, after the debridement, we had about eight centimeters of diaphyseal bone defect, as you can see in the tibia. So the void in the tibia was filled with uh, an antibiotic PMMA cement. And uh, as you can see, that was able to close the void. And then we stabilized the tibia with Taylor special frame. So the skin was opposed um, at the surgery. We were able to achieve a skin opposition. And then as you can see, the leg appeared uh, stable. At six weeks, uh, post, the, post, post the first surgery, we went back and then we extracted the PMMA cement we had not seen any recurrent sinuses. So we extracted the cement and then we filled the void, the void in the acido membrane with cortical cancellous earlier crest autograft. And we augmented the graft with um, calcium hydroxyapatite crystals. Our external fixator was stable. 
One year on, the external fixator was removed. We had not seen any recurrence of sinuses, as you can see, the leg, the skin had uh, recovered pretty well. The external fixator was in situ, well fixed. Now, after removing the external fixator, we took an X-ray of the right tibia, and this is what we see. Um, most of the graft had incorporated, but there is still some lucency, some persistence of fracture line at the proximal end. Uh, however, the patient has now no uh, discharging sinuses around the, the leg, and there hasn't been any recurrent sinus for the past one year since the surgery was done. So going forward, our plan is to uh, insert a tibia nail um, to, and to also um, introduce a cancellous autograft at this side to further improve our chances of getting the whole tibia united into one block. This is what we have done so far and where we are. Thank you for your attention. Any comment? Thanks, Dr. Yubel. That was excellent. Good case, a tough case. Um, good principles there of showing how you have to remove the hardware, control the infection before you know putting any new hardware back in there. And I think you've shown a good use of the PMMA spacer uh, for uh, managing that big um, bony defect. Um, I want to invite Dr. Goslin, uh, if you're on the line, to maybe make some comments on this case. Um, are you there? Yes, thank you, Kiran. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, hear you perfectly. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Apologies for uh, joining in a little bit uh, late. And uh, thank you for presenting uh, this case, Dominic. <clears throat> many, uh, many interesting points can be made on this case, I think. Uh, unfortunately, we did not uh, see the initial x-rays. Uh, I, I still have a tendency to try to when possible, treat closed fracture without internal fixation when I'm not completely convinced uh, of the uh, quality of the environment. <clears throat> but uh, apparently this was uh, done with internal fixation uh, with the plate, which uh, eventually uh, created uh, some uh, uh, septic complication. So the plate was removed, if I remember correctly, a nail was inserted and the x-rays with the nail show a couple of uh, issues, bi biomechanical issues. Uh, first, the nail's a bit uh, short in the distal uh, segment, I think. And the other thing I really don't like about these x-rays, and I don't know if most of the faculty will agree with me, but I, I, I never, and for years and years now, I never use circlage wire on a bone. You, you just kill periosteal vascularization and it's, uh, it's very uh, damaging and uh, leads to uh, osteonecrosis. So uh, for me, uh, circlage wire is an absolute no-no. Now you have osteolysis here. <clears throat> you have certainly chronic uh, osteomyelitis with a bone defect. Uh, I think the management going forward, removing this and creating essentially a masculet technique uh, was the right way forward. And you manage, as you will hear later on, on, on this particular topic, you manage the infection the same way you would manage a tumor. The, 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 the resection needs to be radical so that the management of the infection relies on the excision, not on anti uh, antibiotic therapy. Uh, temporary fixation with the next fix is uh, certainly one way to go. If available, we would have used probably a cement uh, nail and you can make your own nails using a, a Elizaroff rod inside a cement filled uh, chest tube and it works just as well. We can talk about that later on if anyone is interested. So that's probably the way we would have gone, but certainly an X-Fix can be stable enough. I probably would not have liked to keep the X-Fix for uh, a whole year. You, you did very well to avoid the pin track infection, 
I'm not sure how well the knee and the ankle are uh, moving, <clears throat> but that would certainly been uh, one of my concerns throughout to make sure that good exercise regimen was provided throughout. And uh, at this point, you, you have what appears to be a non-infected non-union at the proximal uh, fragment. Uh, certainly, if you had facilities or capacity for bone culture before putting more hardware, I would certainly just go in and take a little biopsy at the non-union site and make sure it's not infected. And eventually, a, uh, <clears throat> a uh, intramedullary nail uh, will be a, a difficult uh, technically. Uh, there's not a, a well-defined medullary cavity in the segment. So you're obviously you're going to need to do a, an open reduction and uh, insert your nail, put more bone graft, and, and uh, for the sake of, compl of completeness, I would probably do a fibular osteotomy and have this patient full weight bearing as soon as possible. So sorry if I was too lengthy in my answer, but- I No, thought... not at all. No, those were very important points. Um, you know, speaking of the fibula in this final x-ray, um, Dr. Rosenwasser and Dr. Dada, uh, who just made the comment now, had uh, made the similar point that it looks like there's a cross union of the proximal fibula. Um, Dr. Dada, did you have any comments that you wanted to make on this case? Well, yes, um, thank you very much. Uh, I think Dr. Yibo has done quite well. It's, it's, it, this is a very common um, challenge that we face in this part of the world. And I think the last speaker made this very important point that um, sometimes in a lot of these closed fractures, um, particularly in the tibia, and then um, especially some of those ones who also have some minimal um, um, wound, it, it's sometimes better to actually treat these patients um, non-surgically. Okay, um, and the reason is the risk of infection because usually um, an infected bone sometimes is very unforgiving. And obviously what has happened in this case is that um, this young lady was treated with um, open reduction internal fixation, I guess, initially with a plate, 4.5 uh, plate. And it's, 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 not very, it's not uncommon that when you do that, particularly in this environment where you can't guarantee um, sterility, you have this infection and the patient um, most of the time is worse off, like we have um, in this case. Um, the other thing that I saw in the x-ray is that uh, um, um, when Dr. Yeboah's team were managing, I thought that um, it would have been better if a fibulectomy had been done, you know, um, that probably might have helped them in the healing process. The gap we're seeing um, after this second treatment with the external fixator may actually have been as a result of the strutting of the, of the bone by, by the intact fibula. Maybe if a fibulectomy had been done, it may have helped in achieving a union. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Dada. Dr. Yebo, did you want to make any comments? Yes. Thank yeah, thank you for your, your great comments. Yes. Um, in my center, similarly, we, we hardly, no, almost no surgeon puts in circular wires. So as I mentioned, this case was managed and referred to us from a, a neighboring country. And um, we were wondering why they chose to even uh, perform internal fixation of the tibia in the first place, because this was a teenager with high propensity of healing. And uh, um, why did not even, uh, did they not even treat it with uh, cast immobilization? So that, that, that is an issue. So we, we're not surprised of the outcome we, we have now because probably the initial uh, decisions were, were, did not go well. Um, yes, the external fixation was for one year because the patient had to go back home uh, to their country and come for, for us to continue the, the treatment. So at the time you were mounting the external fixator, the fibula was not united. So the fibula union you see here occurred when the patient was in the external fixator over the one year period. So going forward, if you perform the, the tibia nailing, we're going to do uh, um, 
osteotomy of the fibula to uh, improve uh, contact at the, at the level of the non-union. So these are beautiful comments. Uh, thank you very much for your thoughts. All right, Fatumata, are you ready to present yours? Yes, I am. Great, all right, let me pull up your slides. Give me one moment. All right, there you are. Can you see them? Yes, I can, thank you. Sure, go ahead. So going on with the second case, um, it's a non-union, it was a malunion with an um, infection that we ended up with. So next slide, please. So this is a case of SM. He's a 29 year old that presented to us about six months after his injury. So it was a bicycle versus a motorcycle. He was the one that was on the bicycle. So when he had the injury, he went for traditional treatment. So the bone set, uh, they splintered the uh, fracture with a bamboo stick, like the small sticks. And then that was what they did. So he came to us six months later on. Next slide. So those were his, that's his x-ray um, when we saw him at the clinic. Um, next slide, please. So um, we took him in for um, sign nailing, um, opted for open reduction. So when we, um, it was a difficult case, uh, took some hours, about four hours. So we had a lateral incision and then medial incision as well. And then to do a fibrolectomy uh, as in uh, a fibula osteotomy and then also to reduce the fracture. We ended up um, shortening him about three centimeters. Next slide. So that was it. So we had a sign nail in for him, there was a gap um, after the surgery when we did the x-rays. Next. Next slide, please. Yes, shortly um, after that, um, he had a wound breakdown. The, um, you could see from the previous um, slide, he already started having necrosis of the skin. So that was it. Um, then we ended up here with um, discharge from the wound. So we did a post swab, um, which um, uh, the growth was pseudomonas. So he was actually uh, almost resistant to all the antibiotics, uh, except two that we had in the hospital. Next slide, please. So we started him on those antibiotics and then we were fighting with the infection. So we had to do debridement for him. The bone was exposed. Next. So he was on um, amikacin and then Cipro. So he was even resistant to Gent, but amikacin was uh, not readily available. Next, next slide. So that was it. Um, so he had um, the bone exposed. So part of it got necrotic. Then we had to um, take him back to theater to um, um, do more debridement. Next slide, please. So that was him again. Um, so he was in the ward for a, for a while, for more than a month, um, trying to clear off the infection, but it wasn't easy. Next slide, please. So then later on, um, when um, we thought it was all right. So we did a corticotomy. The fascia cutaneous flap was torn, but then it broke down. But then at this point, patient had already, he was fed up. So he decided to request for a discharge. Next slide. Next slide, yeah. So um, this was his images from home that um, he sent us. Um, the bone is still exposed while he's just having a um, daily dressing at home. So he didn't come back. So open for discussion what we could have done better to make sure that we, do, we didn't end up here because patient got frustrated and then we did as well. So thank you. Tough case, very tough case. Um, yes. 
Uh, open to hear comments from any of the faculty. Um, Amanda, do you have any comments on this case? Um, this is a tough case. I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of it. So this is an open fracture, correct? Um, no, it was a it was a closed one. Then he went for closed, transitional. Closed fracture. Okay. Um, <laughs> pardon. I'm sorry, I, I had a question as well, Fatimata, about the beginning. So when the, the patient was treated by a traditional bone setter, and when they came in, yes. um, it was a non-union, the fracture was not united, there was still gross motion there, or were they putting weight on it at that point? And yes. able to... yes. so, so the patient was actually putting weight on it, but he was using the crutches, actually, which is, he was in pain still. All right, so it was non-united. he came to clinic, yes, it was non-union, sorry. And, and what was is the time period between the injury and the time they came to you? Six months. Ah, okay. Thank you. And um, so it was non-united when it came to you, and yeah. it was an open fracture. Okay, um, I don't know. I don't know if I can make a comment. Uh -huh. Yes, please. Okay. Um, again, um, this is pretty common, like we all know. Um, especially in 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 these areas, um, but one thing I always try to avoid, particularly with traditional bone setters, um, particularly also with patients who have been treated with what looks like the traditional splint, which is a tourniquet, is that a lot of the time um, the bones and the surrounding soft tissues have suffered um, very severe ischemia injuries, okay? Um, sometimes the skin still looks nice, but uh, um, you find out that the slightest um, attempt at opening it up to do some surgery um, would actually show that the, the soft tissue and especially also the bone um, have sustained severe ischemia. So usually what I, I try to avoid doing open fixation for these categories of patients, if it's possible, Sometimes you are, you are struck and it's not possible. But many times, if it's possible, I try to avoid open fixation. Um, I try as much as possible to use the external fixators, okay? But if they have had non-union or whatever, we still try to do external fixators. And the reason is because of this kind of um, um, complications, because by the time you do your internal fixation, whether you put in a nail or you put in a plate or whatever, you find out that these structures have suffered severe ischemic injuries and um, at the end of the day, you have this kind of complications, okay? And it's easy for the patients to actually come back um, and blame you, the orthopedic surgeon, because for them, um, they left the, um, the traditional bone setters, the skins were still intact, though they couldn't walk. And I can tell you that the traditional bone setters would have reassured them that uh, if you wait a little bit more, you will still work. The treatment is going on and is doing well. We all know it is not so, okay? And uh, unfortunately, is this kind of thing that actually uh, sometimes causes this loss of confidence between our patients and the orthodox uh, practitioner, not because of what we have done, but the consequences of what the traditional bone setters have done. Thank you very much. I have a question, uh, Kieran. Uh, may may I? Please. So, so I'm I'm curious for those of us who haven't experienced the interaction with the bone, the traditional bone setters. What does a traditional bone setter do for this injury? Do, do they do a tight wrapping? Do they encourage the patient to bear weight even if unstable? What is the traditional bone setter treatment for a mid shaft tibia fracture? What they do, they, they, they basically have um, a, maybe the type of treatment they offer is basically two or three, okay? Um, for all of them, the first thing they do is that they try to put this kind of splint, okay? And the tighter it is, the better, in quotes, all right? As a matter of fact, um, if the patient, because I've actually visited, I, I wrote quite a number of papers on this, so I had to visit some of their practices, you know? As a matter of fact, if the patient...
not shouting, then the party will loosen it in some of those places, they will loosen the splinter and even make it tighter, you know, so that uh, it's when the patient is shouting that they believe that the, the care is good. Now, they don't just leave the splint there. The patient then comes back every two, sometimes every day. Sometimes they admit the patient, but the patient comes back like every two or three days. They remove the splint. They massage the splint. You know, they massage the fracture, you know, distort and disturbs the fracture and apply a lot of uh, local concussions. Sometimes they actually apply scarifications and put some of these local concussions, okay? And so you then, they expose them to infection, you know, and then they tighten the, the splint again, okay? And make it as tight um, as possible. So it's, it's, it's basically what they do for most um, long, uh, long fractures. Sometimes they also, when they are feeling, they then ask the patient to get some, um, maybe big chicken, they break the bone of the chicken, Okay, and then they tell the patient that uh, once the bone of the chicken is healing, their own bone is healing. So at the end of the day, um, the process is such that it's completely opposite to what we know that hates uh, uh, fractures to, to to heal. You know, I mean, if you want fractures to heal, you must you know um, get a good fixation. You must uh, ensure that some some good stability and all of that, and they don't just allow that. And then they then tighten, and then this, because of the um, uh, traditional um, herbs that they apply, okay, you then have a lot of, uh, the skin itself is, has suffered a lot of injury. And then of course the, the tightening, okay, which can sometimes expand, maybe can sometimes span maybe up to 10, 12 cm, um, ensures that not just the bone, but the surrounding soft tissue envelope is completely um, compromised, you know? And so by the time they are getting to you, um, um, those of them who are lucky who will not end up with amputation, um, you've had a soft U envelope that has suffered very severe um, ischemic injury. And uh, quite a number of times, the bone itself has suffered ischemic injury. And so if you just go in with your um, internal fixation, you, you, you probably will just miss the point. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you, Dr. Dada. Um, Abdullah, you got a question? Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, so I just wanted to ask, um, with so many of your patients presenting to traditional bone setters for, first, I was wondering if there were any collaborations with traditional bone setters or maybe education on like maybe better ways that they could uh, um, potentially reduce fractures instead of what they're doing now um, that's causing, it seems to cause more harm than good to patients. So I was just wondering if there's any collaborative efforts going on. Yeah, um, I don't know. Can I answer? Uh, well, why don't we ask first Fatumata and um, and Dr. Ka, who managed this patient, to answer, and then we can ask uh, you, Dr. Dada, and Dr. Yeboa to comment because I know both of you have done a lot of work on this particular topic. Fatumata, do you have a comment on that? Um, thank you very much for the. Dr. Keba yeah, hello. And Dr. I will comment on that. Yes, they are commenting. <laughs> Go ahead, Dr. Ka. Okay. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Um, what actually happened with uh, this particular patient was. When he presented to us with the six months old malunion, um, I would say everything was nicely done. And uh, he was discharged five days into his post-operative period. He was fully mobilizing, fully weight bearing with crutches. So we were appointed to see him for wound check in the subsequent week. Unfortunately, what happened was he missed his first appointment and went to another person for dressing. So we even had to know to another patient that this particular patient called him and said his wound is oozing. So we had to go to our records, call him to immediately come back to the hospital. And when we exposed the wound, that was when we saw it was already necrotic with a gauze put inside. We mm -hmm. couldn't um, guarantee the sterility of the dressing that he had out of our hospital and what actually happened. So we kept him back in. Um, gave him antibiotics. We, at that particular point in time, decided that we are going to do dia. We are going to probably debride, give him antibiotics and retain the implant because stability of the fracture was not compromised at all. So the infection got a little bit worse. His um, anterior and lateral tendons of the foot were a little bit exposed. If you see on the, lateral, um, on the latest clinical photograph, he has clawing of his toes. So because his, his extensors were also affected. But then by far and light, what later happened was we managed to suppress the infection without compromising the stability of the fracture. However, we still have the sequelae of the 
external mechanisms to deal with. So he stayed for long. Uh, at some point, he was not happy. We took him back in, tried to cover it. And he was like, no, he needed to go home. And he eventually left. And we had to call him to send us um, a photograph that we could even use, uh, the last um, couple of photographs we could use for the presentation. But now he is happy. He is fully weight bearing. And I know it will be difficult to get him back to the hospital. Thanks, Dr. Carl. Yeah, tough. So, and, and also, just to comment on what um, um, the last question was, if we do have any collaborations with the traditional bone setters. Uh, what happened here is one, they wouldn't want us to know who they are. We, the only link we have between them is through the patients. And uh, most of them, these are means of survival, is a means of earning a living. So they would do everything possible to make sure that the patients are kept with them so that they will continue to earn from the patients. Uh, however, their collaborations in some other countries, um, I was opportune to listen to the Ghana experience and that of Ethiopia as well, where they're trying to integrate these traditional bone setters into having them know uh, probably also uh, allowing them to be able to refer patients um, where, where, where necessary. But um, from our own experience, we have not yet collaborated with them, but we're looking forward to how we uh, need to have that link between us and them. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Khan. And I'll, I'll put in um, uh, just a shameless plug for um, a work that we have been doing. We're proud at HGOC to have worked with uh, Dr. Yeboa, uh, Dr. Dada, and also Dr. Diallo, um, and uh, we put together this consensus statement on traditional bone setters, which we've submitted for publication now. And it talks a lot about the, the need for, um, uh, you know, some form of regulation, some form of collaboration, something basically to manage or mitigate the complications that are sometimes caused by these traditional bone setters. Um, so we are running a little low on time, unfortunately. Um, Dr. Dada, Dr. Yaboa, why don't we just refer everybody to the wonderful uh, webinar that you both were a part of, uh, where we specifically spoke about traditional bone setters. Um, if somebody from the HGOC team can put that link into the uh, chat box, that would be great. Um, uh, but I think maybe we should move on to the next case, if that's okay with everybody. Yes, it's fine. Thanks, Dr. Dada. Sorry, I'm sorry for cutting things short. I know that this is a very uh, yeah. controversial topic and lots of things to say. Um, yeah. So let, let's move on to the next one. Uh, Dr. Ka, are you ready to present yours? Um, yes, I've followed my presentation. Uh, Dr. Marina will project it for me and I will do the presentation. All right, well, we'll let you, in the time being, actually, I think that we cut off Dr. McCoy, who was making a comment on this case earlier. I'm sorry about that, Amanda. Did you wanna, do you wanna make the comment that you had on Fatimata's case? Um, it's a pretty difficult case, um, and, you know, like Dr. Detta said, the soft tissue management is everything for this, and so when you're doing these big cases, if you do decide to open, although I do agree with an XFIX approach to this, um, when you have to be completely meticulous in your soft tissue management, and oftentimes you're going to have to leave a drain as well, because you have this large hematoma that exists, and it's a setup for infection, <laughs> so that's the one thing I've learned, and my experience of taking care of these um, delayed uh, presentations with tenuous soft tissue envelopes, you just have to be completely meticulous in your dissection and manage your dead space appropriately with the drain. Great teaching point. Thanks, Amanda. Oh, Karen, I'll make a comment on that last uh, non-union tibia case if there's time. Please, Dr. Rosenwasser, go for it. So two things, when you have a late non-union and it's short, I'm, I'm assuming that the four hour time to try to repair it had to do with trying to regain the length of that tibia. And uh, in general, that's not something you should strive to do. When you have a, a shortening, you should just allow the, the tibia to shorten and make it easier. All it does is put more stress on the soft tissue envelope, even though I saw there was a primary closure at, at that operation. And then once it, the wound broke down, I don't think that the sural fasciocutaneous flaps are really um, you know, very reliable and certainly not for a large volume defect that I saw with that entire anterior cortex missing. That type of, of coverage is very thin. It does not fill the space, the volume, and it does not bring much blood supply. 
So you really need a muscle type flap to get coverage when you have a very large defect uh, with bone involved as well. So I would, it's very tempting to try to use something regional, uh, but I don't think that the, uh, the fascia cutaneous flaps are reliable. So what would you have done in, in, in the place of that? Well, I mean, I, I might have, in order to take uh, stress off the original wound, I would shorten the tibia for sure and try to get closure without any tension. But once the wound had broken down in that location, um, the only thing that you can do is to bring a muscle flap over. So if you have microsurgical um, expertise or, or access to consultants, that would be my preferred mm -hmm. technique would be a free flap. And if you don't have that, then of course, the next best thing, and it's been used successfully for a long time, is cross-leg frap from a from leg that's not injured, obviously. And we've got some really excellent cases coming up in the next hour on that specifically. So we'll, we'll wait to talk more about that uh, for all those who don't know about that procedure. So uh, Dr. Ka, go ahead. Um, thank you very much. Greetings to everyone. Um, I present the case of uh, a male patient with a severe lower limb injury. Um, he was a patient who presented to us uh, in an ER, and um, the slide subsequently will show what we've done for him. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a 50-year-old, 51-year-old male who was involved in a road traffic accident, pedestrian versus an ambulance. Um, he was lucky enough because that ambulance was heading to our hospital, and uh, he was brought in by the ambulance on the one hour post injury. He had no pre-hospital um, care. The limb was um, guarded up by the bystanders and helped to um, put him into the ambulance. There was no limb splintage as well. Um, upon arrival at the ER, um, the ATLS guidelines we used to approach his needs and his adjuncts were also addressed. So clinical photographs and x-rays will be shown on this slide. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, this was how the leg um, looked like. He had a um, distal or oh, middle one third tibia fibula fracture with massive soft tissue injury and the, the gloving as well. So the limb was straightened and he was sent to have an X-ray. Um, the X-rays will be in the next slide. Next slide, please. So the, these were the initial injury x-rays showing um, distal middle one third uh, tibia and a segmented fibula fracture. As you must see, um, if it were not for the soft tissue injury, this would have been an easy fracture to manage. However, but I've been looking at the, the previous slide, the injury to the soft tissues was massive. So um, about three hours post injury, he was taken into the OR and we had initial driving was done. Next slide, please. So we had the initial debridement done. Uh, we had already decided that we were using an external fixator. He was started on early antibiotics and um, was taken back to the ward and he started knee physiotherapy and knee movement. So however, I must comment that on the medial aspect of the, the distal tibia, uh, the tissues were degloved. However, we were not tempted to remove them. We divided it and then allowed it to settle down in the coming days to determine what we would do. Next slide, please. These were his initial clinical, uh, post-operative clinical photographs and the initial post-operative x-rays. The bone alignment was not bad. And um, we were worried about the soft tissues. We started him on um, prostate antibiotics. And um, subsequently, this was what happened. Next slide. Uh, 14 days into his injury, we had necrosis of the overlying the um skin. There was visible pin track infections. The stitches were broke down. And at some point, the bone on the anterior part aspect of the, the tibia was, was also exposed. Next slide, please. Um, he had um, second debridement, um, but if you see on the um, the photograph, the the bone was exposed on the middle part of the of the of the of the tibia. Next slide, please. 
So he went on to have his death in front of his antibiotics six weeks into the injury. Um, there are visible signs of infection over the exposed um, soft tissue areas. There was more soft tissue dead. We had granulation tissues around the wound edges and we um, switched over to honey dressings. And um, that was what we used for, from that time until we had these um, results. Next, please. So by 10 weeks, um, the wound was clean. It was well granulated. Uh, we were waiting for plastics and a definitive plan. Uh, at that juncture, we had already decided that if we had a good uh, soft tissue cover, we would be able to nail the limb and probably the patient will go back to his daily work as a class teacher. Next, please. So three months after his initial injury with the devitalized tissues and the infection, the patient had his um, skin grafting done uh, last week. And um, the highlight of the case is the primary amputation was avoided. In looking at the severity of his injury, uh, this patient would have been a candidate for primary amputation considering the uh, resource limited settings that we work in. However, our department is um, an advocate for limb salvage where possible. And we believe that these are lessons that we could share as well. Next, please. So the take home message from this case would be limb salvage is still a viable alternative for primary amputation, even in resource limited um, um, settings. The external fixator we believe is an alternative to the bone saw. That is, you could save the limb rather than um, primary amputate where possible. And also a multidisciplinary team approach would always be better to address this um, complex and lower limb injuries. We had the support from a plastic surgeon who recently joined our practice. And um, we also had an infection specialist as well who helped um, um, in battling the, the infection. So soft tissue preservation always takes precedent, regardless of how uh, trivial that bone injury was. It is as if though we could have gone and fixed them if you were not having a clear picture of the nature of the soft tissue destruction. However, we should always remember that the bone is a tree with its roots in the soft tissues. If you fix the bone, not respecting the soft tissues, you wouldn't attain the results that you so desire. Next, please. So thank you very much. At the, in the end, the limb was salvaged and primary amputation was prevented. And the way forward, as we're thinking, is to nail the limb and allow the individual to go back to his pre-injury work. Thank you very much. And I'm open to uh, suggestions and questions and comments. Um, Andrew, you got your hand up. Did you have something you wanted to say? You're muted. So I realized he used um, honey dress not the points. And then um, um, I want to find out if how effective is that like in controlling for like infection when you have a very bad um, necrotic also of the skin. Um, and so has anyone used it and what are the, um, how, how successful are, have you been um, with using the uh, money, my, the honey dressing? It's actually a very common uh, treatment uh, for open wounds. Um, it's a hyperosmotic solution, essentially, which um, causes, which is prevents bacteria from growing and can actually lyse the bacteria. Uh, that's my rudimentary understanding of it. Um, we even use Medihoney um, uh, here in the United States. Uh, and so, um, yeah, Gladys is commenting it works. Uh, Gladys, do you want to give the uh, perspective from Malawi? She's just saying. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes, Sorry, we can. I, I, had to, I had to turn on my mic for a bit. Sorry, I'm just coming from theater, so I've had a really rough day. Um, so we use honey like at the Baker Hospital uh, and Blanche are here all the time on wounds, especially, you know, open. I had one patient, particularly open fracture, um, to be a X fix, same thing, a pediatric patient, she was about 13. She did quite well. The wounds um, tend to, uh, before I went to cure, I get the skepticism. Before I went to cure, I was not an advocate for honey, to be fair, because it, in my mind, it's counterintuitive. Add something sweet to something where bugs can, you know, manifest is just, in my mind, it just didn't make sense, but it actually does work. 
the the bacteria clears up so it actually it actually works i i don't i'm not exactly sure why it works but it works and we use store bought so that's that's fine yeah less fancy than our meta honey but i think the purpose is the same <laughs> i think it's the hyperosmotic solution that does that um, but any any other comments from the faculty on this uh, this tough case? So um, the 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 issue about um, hoping for granulation tissue in the distal third of the tibia so that it can be skin grafted is a difficult one. Um, any skin that you could get to to survive there is going to be unstable skin, which will be frequent uh, breakdowns with minor trauma, uh, which will expose the leg uh, to other other insults. So you need to have stable, some kind of stable coverage when you have a very bad wound where you've debrided extensively and you're in the pretibial area in the distal third, you need to have a, a durable kind of coverage. And um, I have no problem doing anything to help the wound stay healthy, uh, whether it be honey. And I saw that when I was in Tanzania, people were using honey as well and, and with good results. So I've never done that. Um, I, I happen to like Dakin solution, which is essentially a Clorox, a diluted Clorox solution, which is very well tolerated by tissues, very inexpensive and bactericidal. So, I mean, that's what I use, but that would only be temporizing until I could get a, a stable coverage for that area. Um, in addition to using honey, if you start to have a green tinge to your, to your gauze and to your dressings, so you want to think about cinnamonis. And um, vinegar is also a very good adjunct for wound care in that sort of situation, just as we're bringing up the issue of wound care. And as you're um, planning for your definitive fixation, I would just recommend it's very important to make sure you give a pin holiday uh, before you do your, your definitive internal fixation. Because if you do not give a pin holiday, your bone may still be seated. So, so Kieran, uh, it is a great case, and, and I'll have to say, any outcome in which the foot is still attached in this particular case is remarkable, because this, given the extent of soft tissue injury that those images suggested, that case would have easily gone to amputation, even in the most resourceful uh, uh, settings, right? So, so but, but going, going to principles, you know, I, I, I want to I clarify, when you have that devastating injury, how many times that case went to the OR before you were comfortable enough to, uh, to, to think that you concluded your first stage of debridement? Because did you take that case to the operating room two or three times, or was it just once to put it together with that image you showed, and then not till a few days later? I just, I'm just, I'm just want to clarify that timing and that initial first, first three, four day management. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for the comment. Um, in answering to your question, the person came in, the initial photograph is the first um, look that we had when the patient came into the ER. The, the limb was not splinted. He was just held by bystanders and um, loaded onto the ambulance. So when we had those um, clinical pictures, the leg was covered and sent to x-ray. And two, three hours after injury, we took him to the theater one. So when he came to the theater that first time, it was copiously irrigated. We started him on antibiotics and had the X6 done. So the initial um, post-operative X's uh, I'm referring to are the ones on the first look when we took him once into the theater. So the only second time that he went back to the OR was when he had subsequently the, the infection and that was also debrided. And uh, finally, he went back to the theater for the third time is when he was with the plastics. And I agree with the, um, the comments that considering the anterior part of the, the tibia being um, 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 subcutaneous and no uh, enough soft tissues to cover them, we considered having some other flaps done. But then looking at the, the severity of the soft tissue injury, um, the challenge was what soft tissue were we going to mobilize to cover that extensive wound? So that was why we kept it that way, uh, keep dressing and then um, 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 eradicate the infection. Thank you very much. So the second surgery was how many days after the first surgery? Um, just a minute. Um, it's the next one, slide number eight. Okay. Slide, so yeah. So that's, that's what I was. I apologize. That, that's what I was trying to to suggest that yeah. 
Yeah. You know, you went to the operating room a second time when you already had an infectious process. You know, sometimes yeah, yeah. It's, worth, it's worth, and I know it's very difficult when you have so many patients and, and, and resources are tight, but, but maybe had you gone to the operating room uh, for scheduled second and third look after the initial injury, you may have spared some of the infection because, it, because no matter what degree of expertise you have, you have applying to the injury, it is just very, very difficult to get a proper debridement of such an extensive wound with just one washout. Uh, and, and, and you could have come back two days later, undo the stitches, or loosen up the expex, wash it all again, and then reclose it. And yes, that indeed puts a little stress on the skin, but it may have been uh, you know, a bit more, it, you would, I would hope that it would have reduced your chance of the infection happening, perhaps. The uh, the only comment I had from this case, and granted, I'm not a lower limb expert um, uh, by any means, but um, the the proximity of your pins and the distal tibia to this like severely traumatized tissue would give me a little bit of uh, uh, pause. You know, I would worry about that further traumatizing the soft tissue and introducing a potential infection there. I mean, I wonder if you'd consider doing just an ankle spanning. I mean, you're already putting a pin into the first metatarsal. Like, why not go into the calcaneus and just span that entire traumatized area. Um, I, I was wondering if you'd considered that. And also from those who are more experienced managing this trauma, is that anything that you would consider? Well, well, sometimes you have to put the pins where they provide the stability that you need. You know, the, the last thing you want is to have a, a flaccid part of the fracture impinging from the inside out in, in a part that's vulnerable already. So, I mean, the, the, the injury is so extensive that uh, I, 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 if I had to put a pin close to the edge of the wound, I, I would find that acceptable if it, was, if it was the only way to do it. Kiran, can I add something? Please, of course. Uh, concerning the uh, honey dressing, actually uh, at, at ICRC for years, we have been uh, using uh, just plain old table sugar because you can't find that any anywhere. It's very cheap and uh, it promotes granulation a little quicker than just wet the dry dressings. Uh, and it is by hyperosmolarity that uh, the uh, the effect is supposedly attained. Now, more recently, for the same type of wounds, we have been using some kind of a improvised vag dressing and a little more expensive, but certainly with uh, much easier on nursing, the sugar dressing, and I don't know how it goes with the honey, but the sugar dressing at least needs to be changed every day. It's quite messy. It's uh, nursing uh, demanding. So in the end, uh, even uh, if it's more expensive in initially, uh, improvised vac is uh, probably more cost efficient. And there's a young lady who made a, a point earlier on on giving at least some kind of a pin holiday before preparing for a, a internal fixation. And I totally agree with that. We, we routinely do that when we are doing our, our mescale. And uh, I would actually would like to see an x-ray of how it is now uh, once the x-fic is removed and uh, maybe, it, maybe there is actually no need for internal fixation. Maybe this guy can uh, uh, avoid risk of uh, another surgery just with uh, some kind of a patellar tendon bearing cast or something like that. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Wilson. Uh, excellent cases. Um, for the purposes of time, um, we have one last section left and with three excellent cases that all involve soft tissue reconstruction. Um, Dr. Ryan Colley, I see you're on the line. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, sure, no problem. I'm happy to happy to help out. I'm one of the colleagues of uh, Sami Dalla Shahi, um, one of the plastic surgeons over at Beth Israel. Uh, I do um, expert in microsurgery uh, and wound care. So I'm happy to happy to take part. Wonderful to have you here. So the next three cases are all regarding soft tissue and bony reconstruction, but just to give everybody a pause to clear clear their uh, clear the air after those three tough cases, why don't we 
take a three minute break. I'll see you all back here at 20 past the hour and then we'll begin with our last section. All right? Sure. All right, see you all in just a moment. Ryan, thank you for joining us. Sure, no problem. <laughs> all right, well, thanks everybody. Uh, so those were that was the second session. Now we're entering the third. So this is on post-traumatic reconstruction, looking at soft tissue and bony defects. Uh, so thanks again to all the faculty who recorded really excellent presentations. Uh, those are all freely available on YouTube for anybody who's interested. Uh, I do really encourage everybody on the line to go check those out. Um, a lot of time and energy was put into preparing those recordings. Um, so for the next session, we'll have three case presentations, all of which involve some form of soft tissue reconstruction in the setting of an open tibia fracture. Um, so to start off, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Ka again to present his case, which involved a cross-leg flap. Uh, Dr. Carr, are you uh, available to do that? If Dr. Carr is not available, then maybe Dr. Yeboah is available. Dr. Yeboah, are you back? Yes. Uh, yeah, okay. Oh, I'm back. Okay, Dr. Yeboah, why don't you start off then? Share my screen. Yes, please. Go ahead. Okay. So I present a case of a 36 year old male who got involved in a road traffic accident as a motor rider um, who had no crash helmet on. Um, he lost control of his uh, <clears throat> motorbike, ran into a pool uh, and presented to us with pain and deformity of the left leg on the same day. So at the ER, this was the photograph that was taken um, the patient, uh, Doctor. Sorry, Doctor Yabo, we can't see your slides advancing. Are you sharing the uh, the slideshow or just the presentation itself? Can you see it now? We can just see the slides in like normal editing view. We can't see the presentation itself, like the presenter view. Oh. Oh, sorry. Uh, let me read you. Yep, go ahead. Is it better now? We can see the clinical photo now, yes. Is it okay? Yeah, I think so. Go ahead. Good. <clears throat> so this was the first day when the patient uh, presented to our ER. Uh, he had earlier visited uh, a neighboring hospital where they had dressed and uh, splintered the limb with a cardboard, as you can see. When we exposed the wound, this was the appearance. Um, oh, was... Dr. Dr. Yebo, I'm sorry, it's still not, the slides still aren't coming. It's still just a single slide of the, of the gentleman with a, with a splint on. We can't see the slides wow. advancing. Let me work on it, I'll get back to you. Okay, uh, should we go to uh, Dr. Ka then? Back to Dr. Ka. Yes, I'm here. Let me try to share my screen this time again. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I'll share for right. you. Okay, then that's fine. That's okay. Um, so these are the cases uh, that I, I my, myself and Dr. Marion uh, uh, took part in managing. It's a case of uh, 40, sorry, let me, next slide, please. Is a case of a 51 year old male um, who was involved in a road traffic accident in which he was the pedestrian and he was knocked by a vehicle. Um, initial assessment showed that he had an isolated right lower limb open fracture about the uh, Gustav Anderson 3A. 
and he presented roughly about six hours post injury to our ER. So he had no pre-hospital conventional care. Uh, there was no conventional splinting of the limb. Uh, the limb was wrapped in what looked like a curtain with some ropes tied around it. And upon exposure at the uh, first look on the ER, that was the picture that we had. If you could see there is um, an open fracture of the middle one third with extensive soft tissue injury. Um, there was periosteal um, stripping and the bone was also exposed. Um, his initial radiograph as shown in the next slide. So he had a badly segmental uh, middle third tibia fracture and a proximal fibula fracture as well. So in the ER and the first look, um, the wound was washed and covered with saline. So gross, he was started on antibiotics and some other necessary prophylaxis. 18 hours post injury, he was taken into theater. Next slide, please. So we had um, the bright bar dawn, the fracture was nailed, and um, we decided to do primary closure, and he continued on his antibiotics. It will be interesting to note here that um, we used a solid nail, the sign type of nail. Um, minimal hand rimming was done because of the, the multifragmentary uh, proximal um, um, segment. So we, wouldn't, we didn't want to displace it further. So minimal rimming was done and we slide in the nail um, slowly. So he went back to the ward very well. He started uh, knee uh, physio. We didn't want to leave the wound for a secondary intention. We decided to close um, the skin over it because of the subcutaneous location of the, of the, of the tibia. Uh, approximately two weeks post injury, he had infection, necrosis of the overlying skin and tissues. There was wound breakdown. At this juncture, there was a lot of seroma coming out from the wound. So we locally um, improvised a VAC device using the suction device we had on the ward and um, used some other impermeable dressings and some foam. So we kept him on that um, modified or improvised VAC dressing for about another week or so. And um, this was the wound 21 days post injury. The infection extended proximally, there was limited oozing, and uh, there was some soft tissue granulation around the side, but the, the middle of the wound was necrotic and there was some slow uh, on the wound. Next slide, please. So at that juncture, we've decided that we were going to retain the implant. We were going to try to suppress the infection with antibiotics and debridement because the stability of the construct was not compromised. So approximately a month was injury, there was a uh, bone exposed and the soft tissue had already demonstrated itself. And um, we decided that we were going to debride the patient, retain the implant and have a cross leg flap done for him. Next slide, please. So this uh, was the picture of those debridement. All the devitalized tissues were removed. The exposed dead bone was also um, removed. You could see the nail was exposed. However, a few days after the debridement, we gave him a window period. Then we took him back to theater and he had a cross leg flap that was done for him, as you can see on the clinical photograph. And um, he went on to do well. Next slide, please. So these were the, the donor site and the, the flap um, area um, eventually. There was some oozing distal to the, to the flap. Those were the screws or the wound that we, we used to put in the screws for the distal locking of the nail. And um, we augmented these antibiotics. At some point we had to collect swab and send to the lab and we changed these antibiotics to organism specific antibiotics. We suppressed the infection and he went on to heal very well. And um, subsequently, we almost lost him to follow-ups, uh, very common around this part of the world. And um, these were his final um, clinical photographs. If you see the last on the far right is the flap area uh, fully integrated. 
I wish I could have shared my slide. Yesterday, he, we managed to get to him and he sent us a video of him walking. He's a manual laborer and he's already back to work doing what he was doing. And both the, the flap and the donor side are fully healed and he's fully weight bearing without any, any issues. So we intend to bring him back to <laughs> do his follow-up x-rays. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it because he had some family issues and engagements. So um, I had already said like um, our take home message from this particular case um, also would be one, if your implant and your construct is not compromised, the stability is not compromised, you don't have to go quickly and remove your implant. You could um, retain, retain your implant, you can retain your implant, extensively debride, suppress the infection, and always have a plan for soft tissue coverage and reconstruction. So I will pass on to Dr. Marina, probably he will have some, some comments because he, played a, he, he, he was the main man in the case. Thank you. Go ahead, Keba, if you wanted to give a few words after that. That was an interesting, great, great case. Very tough case. Well done. Yes, yeah, so it's a, he was one that we had a bit of problems with in terms of deciding where to go. When, once you get to having bone exposed and the metalwork exposed with what appeared to be infection, then it was a big decision whether we take everything out, nail again, maybe make up an antibiotic nail, or for the next fix. And then soft tissue cover was the main thing. But the cross tissue flap really worked quite well. And he's now two years down the line. Uh, he did have an x-ray in the interim, but we couldn't find it, which showed some healing. And he hasn't had any recurrence of infection, which was the main concern in two years. And obviously the fact that he hasn't come back um, was an indicator that he seems to be doing relatively okay. Dr. McCoy, did you have something to add? Um, I do. Well, that's a great outcome. Um, so the cross flood flaps are sometimes hard to manage on the ward. So how did you manage this flap on the ward? Um, sometimes people put an X fix to maintain the position of the legs to minimize um, any tension on the flap. So I was just wondering what your protocol was for managing these flaps in the ward before you divide them. So uh, just if I can find it, here we use for him, we put, we put POP. So we had some synthetic cast and uh, fiberglass cast, put that round and kept him in that position for two weeks and they went back to the right. Um, sometimes I found that the axilla of the flap, it can get really soupy. And sometimes it's really hard to get the nurses to kind of get in there to make sure it stays dry on a daily basis. Do you have that issue with the POP? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a concern, especially with the, the environment, the humidity. Um, I think with him, we're happy with how, how clean it was. So we didn't actually dress it in the, I think it was 10 days before we divided it. So we didn't have to go back and dress it. And when we took it off, there was a bit of slough on the donor side, but otherwise it looked fine, luckily. Um, I, I have a comment about the flap itself. To me, it looks like it's just a cutaneous flap. And the question is, did you bring some of the soleus over with it? This is a you know volume defect, not just a surface two-dimensional defect. And, uh, and, and I think when you bring muscle, you have a much more vital area, which you can then graft under uh, with vascularity. So it's hard to see uh, with that one cross-leg cross picture, whether or not that's just a cutaneous flap. Yeah, it was just it was just a fascia cutaneous flap. There was no muscle um, uh, cover, it was just uh, fascia cutaneous. Yeah, and so my, my recommendation would be you're there and you can easily raise it, and, and it can be, um, you know, a partial. It doesn't mean you have to take the whole soleus uh, because the soleus has segmental blood supply from the posterior tibia uh, the artery, and you can take a segmental or hemi soleus type flap and rotate it with the skin and get a much more, I think, a much more uh, vigorous type of vascular uh, revascularization of a very damaged leg. Ryan, any thoughts from the plastic side? 
Sure. Yeah, I was going to. So just to start out, I would say that um, I usually whenever I start to see eschar early on over a wound, like some of the earlier photos, I typically try to get that debrided. You know, sometimes it, people are hesitant to debride it off because they're thinking, well, I don't want to, you know, expose what's underneath. But the problem is that underneath that there's basically no dressings can get to it. And it's just a pool of pus. Um, and the antibiotics that you might be on, uh, if you know, via IV is, is not going to work either because essentially it's an abscess. So really it's helpful, you know, even early on when we, when you did the VAC therapy there, which I think is reasonable once it gets clean, but maybe that was not clean enough, I think, for the VAC at that time, just based on the photos. So I typically would start with, I, I really like dilute Dakin's dressing. So I actually dilute it down to about 1 16th. Um, there's a study that shows that actually, if it's uh, that the quarter strength, which is typically what people use or the eighth strength, it typically has, uh, it, it's a little cytotoxic. So if you dilute it down even more, I actually take a little bit of it and mix it with saline and do wet to dry dressings with that. And it tends to be really good. I, I did a burn fellowship as well. And so we use that frequently for uh, a lot of these really nasty uh, wounds. Um, so then once you start to get the granulation, which will be much more robust once you get the bacterial colonization down, then I think that you'd be ready for either the vac therapy or obviously your, your free tissue or, or, you know, or you know, pedicle tissue flap. I think that um, I, I don't typically bring muscle when using a pedicle flap because I think that it's, I'm concerned sometimes that it's not going to take as well as with a fasciocutaneous flap. A lot of studies show that the the integration of the uh, IV you know antibiotics works just as well with fasciocutaneous flaps as with muscle flaps. So I don't think you necessarily need muscle, at least in my experience. Um, but either way, I think just really having a nice clean wound bed um, and trying to get that clean as quickly as possible, really using those dressings uh, to do that is uh, those are the my uh, my points. But yeah, you know, the other last thing would be that when you have just bone exposure, sometimes that can you know you by definition have some sort of osteomyelitis likely, and that can be cleared with antibiotics. If you have a you know metal rod exposure, I do worry that there's going to be some biofilm on that over the long term, and sometimes I know and you know, you end up having to be on antibiotics for a very, very long time, if not indefinitely. But, um, but it sounds like he's doing well, and that's that's great. Um, I mean, I think overall, uh, tough case. Yeah, well, a very tough case and very well handled. Um, so, just for the interest of time, let's move on to Dr. Gaboa's case, which is also a cross leg flap. We'll have more time to talk about these uh, different options for for um, soft tissue management. So, Dr. Gaboa, are you uh, set to present? Yes, Grant. Let, let me uh, try sharing the, the screen again. If it doesn't work, I'll let you share what you have. Okay. It, is it okay now? Well, let's see if it advances. We're seeing right now case one, a mangled lower extremity, just the slide, not in presenter view. Perfect. So this was a 36-year-old man. Uh, who got involved in a road traffic accident. Um, he was sent to our center. So this was the photograph at the ER. He had earlier been sent to a nearby uh, clinic where they uh, splintered the leg with a cardboard and applied this uh, dressing. So at the ER, when we exposed the, the wound, this was what we saw, um, a very extensive deglavian injury involving the distal uh, media um, leg and a uh, part of the foot. Uh, in fact, at the time of initial assessment, the posterior tibia artery pulse could not be palpated. However, the, the foot appeared quite pink. Um, capillary foot time was a little increased. Um, he was able to wriggle the toes. So um, we thought there was room to uh, survey the limb. So initial debridement was done, taken to ORO irrigation um, and uh, external fixation was done. But before that, the initial x-ray we took showed this uh, multifragmentary fracture of the distal left tibia uh, with articular extension, which you can see on the lateral view. Uh, there were also some losses of bone fragments uh, at the time we examined the patient at the OR. 
So um, this was a second look, um, a second look at, at um, three days after the initial development. And as you can see, um, we had uh, a lot of uh, bone loss, especially um, distal tibia metaphysia bone fragments were lost, um, an extensive loss of uh, skin, fascia, muscle, and tendons. So we decided to raise a cross left flap at the time of second loop, uh, which was fascio cutaneous, uh, just as uh, Kiba did. <laughs> we didn't include soleus flap, um, the fascia and the skin. Um, random pattern, and uh, we stabilized the flap with an external fixator. We sometimes use a cast, but in this case, use an external fixator to stabilize it. And uh, the patient was left in this for two weeks. Um, at two weeks, the patient was brought back to the OR, and this was how it looked like. And the cross left flap was divided. Uh, as you can see, this was the donor site, and this was the recipient site. Um, so inserting was done. We went around to tagging the edges of the flap uh, into the wound to make it uh, smoother, and then apply the split thickness skin graft to the flap donor site. So this was uh, six weeks, um, six days after the inserting and the flap had survived, though we had some marginal flap necrosis, but in, on the whole, the bone had been covered. Um, so going forward, what we want to do is to treat the, the bone loss and we intend to place the PMMA cement spacer and leave it there for, for six weeks and then uh, probably um, harvest a contralateral fibular graft augmented by a cilatra, uh, cortical cancellous earlier crest bone to fill the bone defect that we have, and then later uh, do fusion, ankle fusion to in an attempt to reconstitute um, the distal tibia uh, and then the ankle joint. Um, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Dr. Yawa. Great case. Um, so I, I don't know if Dr. Goslin is still on the line, but in his presentation, he talked a lot about using muscular technique and using a cross leg flap. So I wonder if he can maybe provide some comments. Yes, still here. Thanks. <clears throat> yes, indeed. Uh, nice, uh, nice case. Uh, interesting uh, and uh, complicated case. So I think that uh, you, you've managed well so far. Uh, we don't really have uh, an updated uh, X-ray after the last debridement, and the, and the pedicle was uh, severed. So, so we still have an updated X-ray. Um, however, as you can see, we have a loss of the most of the distal tibia. It's only a slight uh, block of the metaphysis that is articulating with the talus. So all of this is a defect. Yes about eight centimeters or more. Yes, so I, 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 I totally agree that uh, cement spacer uh, can, can do very well here and uh, induce the membranes that, that will accept the bone graft. Personally, I try to avoid using cortical uh, bone grafts such as the uh, Ipsi or contralateral fibula. And uh, it, you know, I'm, I'm not opposed at all at harvesting more than one iliac crest, uh, depending on the, the size of the, the size of the void. So I think that uh, maybe our plastic colleague can comment on when is the most appropriate to lift a flap of this kind. I would certainly uh, not do it before six to eight weeks myself, but uh, maybe there's a different opinion or those who would go in sooner. No, I think uh, I was going to agree that I think a, a long time is good. I, you know, typically, uh, when we typically move to uh, microsurgery, I say. Uh, sorry, uh, when when, uh, when there's a defect, a bone defect of you know over five or six centimeters, sometimes we worry that the bone graft uh, alone uh, that's non-vascularized uh, won't take, but I think that, um, you know, you're, you're just, just over. So I think that as long as you use the masculine technique and, and, and as we just, just was just discussed, give it some time uh, to, 
you know, to, uh, to clean up the area uh, and to reduce the risk of infection. I think that it's certainly uh, worthwhile. And I, I agree, I think it's nice to get um, uh, used, uh, you can use both iliac crests if you need enough uh, bone graft uh, for this kind of defect, which does look pretty significant based on the images that we're looking at right now. Uh, but I, I would say at least uh, at least two months. Yeah, I, I would agree to not put in a fibular cortical uh, autograft in a wound that, even though it looks good, may still harbor some infection. And the cortical grafts have no resistance to infection whatsoever, whereas cancellous grafts under a vascularized flap, you know, do, ha, at least has a chance. Um, so I try to stay away from that. Uh, it's a, a small point, but I've seen it on a number of the, the x-rays that have done spanning the ankle with a single pin in the metatarsals. And I, and I think that doesn't control the equinus very well. I usually like to have two pins, one medial, one lateral, um, sort of a delta thing that would hold up the forefoot. Because I, I think a lot of these uh, pictures that we've seen today show residual equinus, even with a spanning frame. So it is nice, especially if you're getting ready to do an ankle fusion at some point to have the, the ankle in good position already for that. And as soon as I had coverage uh, and you had, you had a pin holiday, I would go ahead and do a retrograde uh, nail um, with or without the bone graft uh, just to get everything lined up. And then you can always go back, lift the flap up and, uh, and put your cancellous graft around it. Dr. Yaboa, how are you planning on doing your, uh, your ankle fusion um, and reconstruction of the bony defect? So um, we actually going to wait. Um, our primary goal was to get a viable soft tissue coverage first, uh, which we have achieved. So um, as uh, uh, discussed, uh, I share similar sentiment. We're going to allow it for at least two months to have adequate uh, um, incorporation of the tissue um, that we have brought in and to also ensure that we have uh, controlled the infection as much as possible. And then we will uh, go and then open up. We usually will try to open along the edge of the flap, but not to go through it like this, so as to uh, not to disturb it uh, any longer. And that once we, we have been able to control the infection and the contamination with the bone cement spacer. Uh, we will do the, the, the autograft, um, cancellous, preferably from the earlier crest, but if you're unable to get enough, that becomes the issue. Um, but uh, if you're able to fill the total defect with the earlier crest graft, that will be fine. Then you wait uh, maybe for about a year or two before we consider uh, ankle fusion. Keba, any thoughts on this case, since it's so similar to yours? Yeah, I think it's uh, <laughs> well managed so far. Uh, getting uh, the defects, um, bone defect would be one of the challenges, I think, getting it to fill out. You said eight centimeters, and as you said, maybe getting uh, the cancerous from both aliats. But again, you see them still may struggle, I think. And uh, maybe even considering shortening uh, to some extent might be useful in this patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to think about shortening as well with such a big defect. That would make sense. Um, do you guys have retrograde nails to do ankle fusions? Do you just use a side nail for that? Side nail is what I use mostly. It's the only nail we have. Yeah, right. Interesting. Um, all right, well, great. Excellent case. Keba, do you want to present your last case and then we can just close out the, the meeting? Thanks, Dr. Yaboa. Excellent case. Thank you. So uh, the last case of today uh, is an open tibia fracture with soft tissue loss uh, in whom we did a soleus flap. This is actually a recent case of ours. The 37-year-old male uh, who was involved in an RTA 
pedestrian versus <coughs> motorcycle. And um, from the injuries, it seems as though the tire of the motorcycle went over his leg. So he had um, a braided sort of anterior skin, which looked fairly unhealthy uh, at, with a Chris Anderson II um, wound with this tibia and fibular fracture underlying it. Interestingly, he'd also been a patient of ours previously, having had a sign nail in the contralateral femur, which he had healed fine and he was walking okay. So he uh, went on to have, I am nailing on the second day post injury. Uh, we did deployed maintenance. <laughs> Uh, Sorry about that. I did by crossing um, the medial and trauma uh, side to relieve the chin after closing the skin. But even um, then, I still wasn't entirely happy with the skin, but with no plastics cover, uh, we usually just take our chances and try and divide as much as is possible in order to obtain closure. And then did the nail, and these are his post nailing um, x rays. So, AP lateral. So, it was a, again, it said two days post um, injury. It was a fairly short duration nail, 45 minutes uh, with a quick reduction. He was an antibiotics from admission and um, also had cefotaxim pre-op and uh, a second dose post-op and then went on to augment it and the plan was then to just monitor the wounds. So the first wound check at 72 hours post-operatively showed uh, uh, the image on the left where you can still see the anterior skin I was talking about that I wasn't entirely happy with and to, to be honest this was one of a more of a hope uh, into, rather than uh, thinking that it was going to be successful. I was very concerned that the skin would eventually break down because I think it was uh, he had significant decloving from the injury. At six days, again, it's starting to look a bit uh, more necrotic. And then at day 12, it's declaring itself even more. And again, it's still, at this stage, you probably think, why wait? And um, one of the main reasons was I knew we had a visiting plastic surgeon coming in a few days. So we just continued to watch and made up in my head, I already figured out that he needed to have uh, debridement and uh, flap. So eventually at day 21, when we had the plastic surgeon on the scene, uh, he was taken back to theater had the um, that area excised and divided and then had a soleus flap which was raised and a split thickness skin graft was done over the flap these are intro pictures of the flap when it was raised and uh, inserted with good cover and a skin graft placed on top of it so this, this uh, pictures of his one week wound check, which is four, which was four weeks post his injury and uh, nailing, which showed reasonably good um, take of the graft at that stage. Uh, we then kept him a little bit longer, uh, sorry, actually we discharged at that stage and then he came back for his first uh, wound check, which was two weeks after the flap. And there was some loss of the graft, but there was no discharge or oozing and no evidence that there was any underlying infection or that there was any necrosis of the soleus flap itself. These are his most recent x-rays, which were taken yesterday, which show uh, some early callus around the fracture site. And the wound remains uh, much the same as the previous picture. Uh, so it appears that the flap is still viable 
There's no signs of infection. There seems to be some early healing and he's weight bearing through the leg. So that's the, that's our case. Nice case, Keba. Very nice. Um, uh, Ryan, any, any comments on that one? Uh, one thing I was going to ask about is when the soleus flap was performed was when you do the skin grafting, a lot of times it's helpful to make sure that there's no skin grafting over any areas of fascial of, of uh, fascia over the muscle, because that doesn't usually take as well. So sometimes if you're depending on the rotation of either a gastroc or a soleus flap, sometimes the fascia will be up or partially up. So I usually try to, you know, debris off, take off that fascia or at least make put score it a lot so that there's, uh, you're more likely to then get the, um, there might, have, might be like a little bit of fascia there. It, fascia is nice in that it, it helpful for sewing uh, to it as almost like a pledge it, but it's good to kind of score it and make sure there's as much muscle exposed as possible for the skin graft. The other thing is, although this looks uh, very clean, um, sometimes I will, I'll continue using uh, the really dilute Dakin's dressings, which as it was mentioned earlier is a uh, um, essentially like a physiologic bleach. Um, I'll use that over top of the skin graft too, because uh, when you have a lot of bacterial colonization, you tend to uh, have less graft take as well. Those areas, if the muscles are okay, will probably fill in uh, just fine. Uh, but I think what you probably see there is the area that's kind of inferior there where it's white and superior where it didn't take. That's probably where there's a little bit of fascia uh, and, and not muscle covering. And so that might be, you know, yeah, the center area where the muscle was exposed is it took. Um, and the other stuff, sometimes it doesn't take as well, but, but it should fill in. Uh, you might need a little bit of a, a cleanup of some of the wider areas there. Yeah. But a great case, it's, uh, it, you know, I think um, this is a good spot for a soleus flap. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Keba. Um, that, was, uh, that was a great case. I mean, that last session was really excellent, showing a lot of uh, um, like two different methods for managing soft tissue uh, loss. And that was great. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, I'll just open it up to any other comments from the faculty from that case. Um, we're almost at time now. Um, so I did just want to also say thank you to all. Uh, we'll continue to keep the line on for a little while longer, but I understand that people may have a hard stop time. Um, so thanks to all the faculty for participating. I put a link to the post-conference um, survey just to give us some feedback on how we can make these better. If this was interesting to you and you want us to do these in the future, please let us know. Um, we, uh, I'll also make another shameless plug uh, that um, wound vax, negative pressure wound therapy was mentioned in a few of these different cases. And in the uh, low resource setting, it can be sometimes quite challenging. So we've been working very closely with colleagues in Cameroon over the past year to run a case series uh, using a low cost negative pressure wound therapy device that we've developed. Uh, and it's had very good results, which we're hoping to publish soon. So we have this device and we're willing to partner with anybody uh, who's uh, interested in using it. Um, there are more details on our website, which we can post, um, but, uh, one, but thank you. One, one thing I'll, I'll mention, Karen, just because the soleus flap is a good workhorse flap, is to always consider the zone of injury. So if this was a crushing injury, do not assume that the soleus uh, vascularity will be you know, will be robust and, and will be reliable. So if this was, you know, crushed between two large objects, high energy, that may not allow an ipsilateral soleus flap to be performed. Um, I agree. And then sometimes there's a consideration for delayed grafting. So you can observe your, your flap for a bit and then take them back for a skin graft a few days later. The reasons why we did the immediate flap was because we had a, a, a dermatome on loan and we had to send it back so we just did it in the same case and interesting you mentioned with the first case that we did the cross leg flap the first plan was to do a soleus and when we opened up to try and raise it um it was a very small one and it wasn't the, the blood supply wasn't great so we closed and then it came back 48 hours to do the cross leg flap Excellent. Those dermatomes are hard to get a hold of sometimes. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't know how you guys are with the handy knife, but I find it very difficult to use. 
it's a learned skill. I, I've, I always struggle with it. Last time I was in Malawi, actually Gladys, I don't know if she's still on the line, was the one who was teaching us all. She's a resident who's had a lot more experience than any of the consultants using it. So it's a very specific skill. All right, all. Well, um, thanks Gladys. I see you're still here. That's great. Uh, well, thank you all. Um, Keba, it's been such a pleasure putting together this conference with you. Um, I really appreciate it and really appreciate all of the faculty members who gave uh, you know, such wonderful presentations. Um, you know, we learned a lot from them. You've shared your triumphs and also your challenges. Um, some of those challenges are the, the nature of the injuries that the patients present with in their course before they even come into your hospital, but also the challenges of the resource limitations and the hospital system and things like that that can sometimes plague the, the, uh, the, the care of these patients as well. Um, so I certainly learned a lot. Uh, I hope that everybody on the line did as well. Um, we'll continue to organize these sorts of conferences and, and continue to work with anybody who's interested. Um, so thank you. Thank you all. Please do take our, uh, our post-conference survey. Uh, anybody who fills that out will be able to send you a course uh, certificate of participation um, on behalf of uh, HGOC. So thank you all. We'll stay on for a few more minutes just to leave an open forum for questions and all, but uh, the conference is officially ended. Uh, Keba, did you want to say a final word at all? Uh, just uh, thank you to both yourself and Abdullah, especially for getting things started. Uh, I think uh, this was very good to have as the first one. Hopefully we'll have more. And again, thank you to the faculty for the excellent lectures and the um, insights that they've given uh, in this live case conference as well. And for everybody who's uh, attended, hopefully you found it worthwhile. And um, hopefully we'll probably collaborate some more in the future. Thank you all. Thank you.